Hello and welcome to Adam versus the Man on today, Wednesday, July 24th, 2020. I am joined in studio by Comment Jim Freedom sitting right over here. And CJ Abernathy coming to us from South Dakota, our producer, remotely joining us via StreamYard as well. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning in, being a part of this live show. It's an honor to be able to share what we share with you five days a week and to have your time and attention and your love and support in making this show possible. So watching the comments today during the show, comment Jim Freedom. Jim, do we have any, uh, I think CJ's pulling up links right now. I'm having trouble connecting. Oh, you're not connected? Oh, oh, geez. All the fun of doing media in the age of Corona. Well, so Jim, are, are you able to look at comments even right now? Uh, if I pull it up. On my phone, possibly. Possibly. All right, well, comment, Jim Freedom. Wait, can you get on the stream yard on your phone? You can do that, and then you can see the, the aggregate comment section there. Anyway, we got a lot of news stories to cover today. I feel like I've been really bad about this, but if we get into, if we get through all of the headlines today, we might just get to talk about emotional freedom. Now, where did my copy of the book go? Wasn't it right there on the table? I should have a copy of Freedom handy at all times. Someone stole... Oh, it's right here in front of me. Someone <laughs> someone stole my freedom! Oh, no, it was right here in front of me the whole time. What a perfect metaphor, huh? We think that someone stole our freedom. And society, again, it's, you know, there's a lot of these things that we go through as libertarians. You wake up and you go, ooh, okay, yeah, the state is a coercive an entity that is holding back humanity. What? Wow, ooh, and I'm not as free as I thought I was. And you think someone stole your freedom. But you know what? It was sitting right there in front of you the whole time. Holy Kleenex is Batman. It was right under our noses, and we blew it. And with that being said, I think it's time we check in with CJ. How's it going in South Dakota? Are we, we live on Patreon for the first time ever this week. Very excited. Potentially doing a censorship-free show starting. Uh, well, we'll give ourselves a little time for transition for this one, but apparently... If you broadcast through Patreon and you make people pay, even if it's as little as a dollar a month, you can say whatever the frick you want on the internet without having a sense of yourself. Now, I, I'm not, I'm not an excessive cursor. I, there's some computer cursor joke there that I'm just like, wait a second, I don't know that one, but somebody does. No, I'm, I'm not an excessive cursor. Uh, I think one cursor per screen per mouse is just fine. You know, I curse on this show even just because we're in this like weird semi, like I'm not so much worried about the cursing censorship. Well, I, I wasn't until recently. And then CJ says, no, yeah, if you're streaming on YouTube and you curse, you say the F word more than a couple times in a two hour live show that they're going to, that's going to affect you. You're going to get censored because of that. Now, Censored, uh, obviously not government censored, just, uh, you know, private control. But is it private when it's a corporate wing of the government that's doing this, when it's a, a corporation that's so propped up by government, like Alphabet, Google, where Alphabet, which owns Google, which owns YouTube. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this. And so, but it's not the cursing censorship that I'm like, I'm concerned about, and I don't think, uh, I don't think it's going to make a big difference, like the amount of cursing in the show, because even in this like soft censorship, I, I don't know, I, like yesterday, I caught myself saying the S word once or twice, and I was like, because uh, because it's 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 not like if I'm thinking about it, it's not hard for me to say crap instead of the S word or like you know crappy instead of S E. Well, whatever. Yeah, I think we're better off with the door closed, Jim. All right. So <laughs> uh, 
I'm not really worried about the cursing censorship. And I'm, I, it's not like, hey, guys, when we get on Patreon, censorship-free broadcast zone, I'm just going to, like, just drop F-bombs for two hours straight five days. No, no. And it's like, I, I don't have a problem, like, even as a political candidate, in a certain context, giving a speech or an interview. And I just turn on that part of my brain that says, okay, now you don't curse. But it, it, it's a situational awareness of who I'm talking to and what it's for. And when I'm talking to you, when I'm doing this, is this is my show. This is my conversation, right? I, I want to be able to talk to, to, to people who want to listen to me giving you a raw piece of my mind and view on the world as directly as possible. And so I've got this whole other situational awareness that I have to keep in mind that is, well, we're on YouTube. If, if you if you mention that virus named after a beer, you know, you, you never know. You might, you, you know, you might you, that, that that's a controversial topic or you might just get pulled because of that. And the other thing is intellectual property. It's really dumb. It's a racket. It's, it's in the book. Read it. Intellectual property. Um, man. I just to be able to, to show clips of things uh, to, to play music like what we want to do in our pre-show where we're just. You know, like what we used to do before YouTube got crappy like this. <laughs> when I did the three-hour live show in, in Northern Virginia right before, it was like after the TV show was canceled before going to jail. I would sit in the studio dressed up an hour before the show would start to do my prep. And it was really fun because we had this countdown timer on the monitor going for an hour. And it played all my favorite music. And every day I was psyched up and I was hyped up and I was talking to people and doing my prep and putting my links together and my notes and everything. And people could sit in and watch me do that show prep. And like, we can't do that because you can't play any kind of copyrighted music on any kind of broadcast. Or they just, and it's like, uh, YouTube could, like, as YouTube is still an incredible mark of human progress, a boon to humanity. And yet, there's this way that it is, it is it is stifling now and hampering the conversation in a way that it didn't have to. If it came out from the beginning and said, you know what, IP just doesn't really exist here, except in terms of um, if, it, if it's on one of our videos for monetization, you know, like it, it, the whole anyway, I'll I'll stop. We got a lot to go together. Can add to this. All right. Bring it on, CJ. And by the way, one of the stories we're covering today is Amazon censoring a documentary about censorship we'll get to that good morning gentlemen uh, I, I hope your day is more free than it was yesterday all right so uh so uh yeah just to add to what you were saying about youtube this is a process that i go through wrong button every day uh for for uh any video i just used an, a just a simple video click to pretend to upload for this right now as if it was a clip for the day. And as you can see at the top here, it says, be careful. It looks like you might have made mistakes filling out this questionnaire for several previous videos. <sighs> now, if you fill out this questionnaire accurately each time, we can use your input to determine if your video follows our ad-friendly content guidelines. This can help your videos monetize faster so you earn more money and save time requesting reviews. Now, I can tell you I request, request reviews on every single video that we do. And when you click this, you can see that YouTube determined 12 of your recent videos should get limited ads. Of those 12, you correctly rated two. If you think one of our ratings is wrong, request a human review. Now, you can go into all the limited reviews, and it tells you that it was... Uh, I, I, I requested these yesterday. They, I came back on this morning. They were back to needing to be requested again. This happens on every one of these videos. And, and see, the thing is, is that you got to fill out the review... And then, and hope you get out of all the reviews right. And and we we've, we've kind of gone through this uh, before, where y you can see that there are all these categories that that you are required. Whether you use, uh, so I go up. Oh, well, Adam already said hell. Uh, but I said it, so I better I better make sure I click that right now. Um, or if you use a strong profanity, like you're cursing out the man, I gotta click that. Uh, if you talk about adult content, violence, uh, if you talk about any sort of violence whatsoever, and not only, these are not only just like click here if you talked about this, 
it is okay well adult content did you say romantic or kissing Uh oh i better click that oh geez violence mid mild violence real injuries so for example when you talked about the chinese indo uh, disputed the border with rocks i had to click real injury or violence uh you know and and harmful acts drug related content hateful content uh and, and so we got you at two out of twelve yeah, and, and reference, and again, all these break down, and, and then firearms. So if you're even talking about hunting-related content, if you talk about 3D-printed guns, oh, I better click that now because I just said it. Now, look, I click that, and now you are limited ads. And and sensitive issues, this is the, what I call the catch-all, sensitive issues, discussions of modern acts of terror, yeah, or, or, or analysis on opinion, around serious topic events not described above such as do i say it i don't, I don't know if i should say it or not well don't well, say well, it don't well say we it. well we we hinted at it so i better click <laughs> it because they'll say we that we were it was enough for you to figure out what it was so that that is that is <laughs> it, it, and, and again i'm sorry i i pride myself on being uh at least i wouldn't say the smartest guy in the world but i see the questionnaire i see what you've talked about i fill this thing out every day and I'm failing the test. And as a result, YouTube makes it so we make less money and our videos are censored more. So it is absolutely censorship, which is why we need to get to a platform where we don't have to fill this out every day. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what I got on the censorship today, gentlemen. Well, if I may just wrap this up by misquoting one of my favorite classic comedians, Lenny Bruce. He said, if you can't say frick. You can't say frick the government. And now you can't say frick the government on YouTube. I, you know what? I think government's kind of a sensitive topic. Honestly, I'm triggered every time I hear the word government. Maybe we should go send out our little army of flag trolls to go flag anybody else who's saying anything about government or anything, I guess, anything positive about government, really. Uh, all right. That being said, let's get into the headline. Well, no, we, we got a contest. Oh, yeah. Because we are, as we are every weekday, giving away a membership in the ABTM, Adam vs. the Man Producers Club, which is a Telegram group. If you don't know Telegram, great little messaging app, free, ad-free. And they uh, we have a group there that we use for our, our supporters. And if, if you guys $10 a month or more on Patreon, patreon.com slash Adam vs. the Man, you get membership in the Producers Club. And if you win one of our weekday contests, you can also be in the producers club. So, what do we what do we have for today, Jim? What do you feel like of all the things we talked about? Uh, well, you wanted to save the one for Friday, right? Friday, we're gonna do caller number five. Caller number five for yeah. open line Friday. That's yeah. what I'm excited about. You didn't like the change one. What was the other one we decided on? The drop and change and having oh yeah arbitrary. yeah yeah handful of change. Yeah. Oh, the 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 guessing the voice. Yeah. Oh, so we didn't. Did you pull up a clip? Uh, no. I should didn't. I? Should uh, see like now if we're doing this on the fly, right? Like I have to go. Well, if I pull up a Ron Paul clip, everybody's gonna know Ron Paul's voice, right? Um, like, but who would? Oh, wait a second. Um. Oh, I know. I know. I know. I know no, no. I know, I know. When I have, I have a classic, and this is one I actually I first saw in college. Studying uh, protest movement. Well, what was it? Don't give too Social many details movements. about it. Then they'll just look it up. And yeah. Know. Well, I mean, it's this one's so it. famous that you could go. Like, if I give you a snippet, even you're going to be able to guess. You're well, going to be able to like Google five the or words. Ten seconds, and if we can go audio only. On yeah, of course. Then, yeah. Just then, then that's the contest, guys. Just so in case you're not following along. The contest is Adam's going to play an audio clip of a speaker, and you have to guess who this speaker is. For bonus points, you can guess what the event is and <laughs> et cetera, but guessing the name of the voice. If my internet is working, my hotspot is throttled now. What? Yeah, it wasn't even telling me how much data was on. Verizon, Ver like, wait, so I talked to Verizon, a little, little aside. Uh, okay, no, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. Um, you can just pull it up on here and play the audio here. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so where's where's YouTube? I'll pull up YouTube. Um, so yeah, Verizon. I called Verizon yesterday to pay one of my bills, and 
the uh, they said, you know, we're gonna, you know, because I'm not cut off, I'm still behind on, you know, I'm deliberately like, you know, holding it back. Like, you know, I mean, I, I, I've got other stuff I got to catch up on still after the last few months, as you know, most Americans do right now. And the uh, they're like, yeah, well, we uh, we, we don't know. What, what's going to happen? But we can protect you until June 30th. You've you, you yeah, heard this, yeah, right? Same, is, is, yeah. is it AT&T also? Yeah. June 30th? Yeah. So if, if it's June 30th, then... Um, They're going to extend it. Yeah, like this. So they said, they, well, they said, call us on mm -hmm. June 30th. And I was like, call you? They're basically trying to like, get you to do whatever you can and then put you on a payment promise for the rest of it that's what they're because i called them and i was like what's the deal what's gonna happen yeah to like the 30th yeah are you gonna cut you off? are they gonna cut everybody off like there's no way and by the way our opening segment today our first our first news segment is is a a combination of stories uh based on the title of the show uh reopening to the new normal because the reopen like and i'm remember when we first did the the curve of tyranny we have to flatten the curve of tyranny yeah, yeah, yeah. i was like well it could go back up because they've got this formula and it, well i was like yep. you know and i don't want to say i predicted it because this one i didn't call it i didn't say this is what's going to happen but i said it was a possibility and it's like yeah one of my worst possibilities is is coming true so let's see if this is it i'll stop it if it gets too recognizable whoops don't show on the screen yeah. All right. Well, how do I uh, unlock face ID here? Sorry. Oh yeah. Which your button's different than mine. All right. I was trying to turn the volume. Wait. Now it's on me. Yes. What happened? I don't know. There. Oh wait. Here we go. All right. So here we are. Fair students are getting the axe. Six organizations are getting the axe. They're standing up this semester and preparing for these things. They're getting the acts not for what they did, but for what we have done. They spoke for us, they were part of us, they have been singled out, and they're going to be chopped up. We were told the following If President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the region and his telephone conversation, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? That's the answer. I ask you to consider, if this is a firm, and if the board of regions are the board of directors, and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager, and I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees, and we're the raw materials, but we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product. Don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone. Are you All right. Okay. So what? Who was the speaker? Well, let's see. What was the event? Was it? What, where was that? So this is actually. This is a really great. Could everybody hear that? Okay. Yeah, that yeah, come through. Check the audio okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm like that clip that we just pulled up is really perfect for this contest because it's uh the, the prelude to a really famous part of the speech and if i had played the really famous part i would be like oh yeah, yeah but who really knows it who has watched the full video or remember and this was this is uh, the version i pulled up off my phone here was less than two minutes and it was just, I played a minute and a half. It was just that last, the last 30 seconds. That's the famous part that you remember. It was like, who was paying attention to the context when you were studying this one? So if we have, so the, the, there's, well, we're going to make this a two-parter. Where did that speech take place? And who was the speaker? And if, if, you, if, if you can, if, if we don't get anybody... The tiebreaker will be if you can get if you can get both, right? If we get if if, if you can only because so, there are going to be some people out there who are going to be like oh, I can only get one I can only remember where that was and I big oh yeah well, they they're talking about some some kind of school stuff in there and it sounds sounds a little bit old 
there, there's two big clues right there, right? If it wasn't obvious enough from the clip. But yeah, when it comes back, you're going to be like, ah, that. All right. So, Jim, it looks like we've lost power. Yeah, while I do these first couple segments, do you mind one way or another? Like, I, I, this is just one of the fun things about off grid life. All of our little, now we have enough technical difficulties with coronaphobia and connections and everything anyway. But right now it's our solar system. Go ahead, go ahead, Jim. I'll, 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 th- I'll get before my, before my laptop totally dies here. Uh, no, we got a while, but oh, it's our charge control. So we have a solar power system set up on a shipping container and it's been there for about four years. Our batteries just wore out and our thanks to our friend, Mike from New Jersey. We got those replaced. It's, they're amazing. So we got the batteries hooked up, but it turns out there was another weak link in our system. And it might be just because it was sitting there on the metal side of the shipping container. We're going to insulate better for the next version of this. Uh, but it might have been that it just got fried just four years sitting there, you know, every day in the summer when the doors are closed on that shipping container, man, it gets hot in there. So thanks to everybody who, you know, makes it possible. Like what, you know, what you do when you donate to Adam versus the man, when you become a patron at patreon.com slash Adam versus the man. You make it possible for me to, hey, I, bu- I bought a new charge controller. And it was, uh, I think I got a $160 version for, I I don't even know. I, I got, Jim and I talked about it, picked it out on Amazon. We're like, yeah, that's the one. So we should have this taken care of. And uh, at least the electric issues, one thing less to worry about very shortly here. Our first story <clears throat> from MSN.com, Bloomberg, virus surges across U.S., throwing reopenings into disarray and and you go wait ah uh, uh, the lie right there in the headline no it's not the virus that is sending things into the disarray we're talking about here and it never was in the first place we are experiencing a very minor health crisis that is being used as an excuse to create a major economic crisis. And all of these major modern economic crises, like the forced unemployment crisis that we're in right now, are manufactured. They're, fa- they're fa- I mean, even, even the, the, the George Floyd thing right now, like this is, to, to a certain degree, this, this is manufactured. Why is it happening now? Why is it happening like this? Why do we see paid protesters? Why do we see bricks put out in pallets? Like, yeah, I know some of that was a little... Well, extra conspiracy. Oh, they throw, they're putting out bricks in random places so protesters can can throw them and loot, looters can break windows and, and things like that. Uh, I, I don't know about all that, but it's clearly happening the way it is because the powers that be want it to happen this way. This is not happening like without their input. Newly diagnosed cases of COVID-19 and other indicators of the pandemic spread soared in hotspots across the U.S. driving city and state officials to consider slowing or reversing reopening plans. Cases are surging in Texas, Florida, Arizona, and in California, which on Tuesday broke its record for new cases for the fourth day in the past week. Even in New Jersey, where numbers have been falling, Governor Phil Murphy warned that the transition transmission rate is beginning to creep up. California reported 5,019 new cases, its biggest daily jump for a total of more than 183,000. According to the state data, the state also hit a record 3,700 hospitalizations. Now, one of the problems with our understanding or the public's understanding of coronaphobia, right? No, not the phobia. The virus itself is that there haven't been enough tests out there to get an accurate sense of the fatality rate in the general public. And so the numbers are very, very skewed. And why haven't there been enough tests? Trump actually engineered it that way. He wanted to slow the tests down because if you have less people testing, I mean, this is sort of like, well, how do we want the virus to look bad? I mean, if you're one of the people who are conspiring to manipulate public information around this in order to exploit people for whatever your conspiracy, your racket is, whether it's, you know, a healthcare thing or a government program thing or make yourself seem important kind of thing. What, what do, do we make it seem worse by making it seem deadly or making it seem widespread? Because statistically, these things are at odds. If you have more tests, 
and you go, hey, look how widespread it is, you're going to have to fabricate a lot more deaths to get the death count up so that the mortality rate stays high enough that people stay afraid of it. Because if you if you say, look, we tested, look, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah, like when it's out, like when the cities that it's gone through, they've already got this, you know, kind of, you know, herd immunity point. It's 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 already being done. You know, okay, fine. Then uh, nobody, everybody goes well. Then I guess we should just kind of let everybody get to that point and not worry about it. These numbers, though, the cases. The thing about if they use the cases now, I think I think their scam was, hey, let's not do as much testing so that at any given point we can start doing more testing. And then go, oh, look, cases have come up, see? I, you know, I I hate to say I told you so, but I told you this is one of the things that they could do with this. Now that they have this formula, now that they've gotten you to believe absurdities and commit atrocities like going along with the forced unemployment crisis, like all the Karens of America, I love that. We should, we should, we really need a band. Somebody, please start a, a, a girl band called Karens of America. I mean, maybe it would be better for like retired old, a, you know, aging rocker ladies to come back and form a band called Karens of America to make fun of that mentality of, of the, the busy body and the control freak, but also those who have been scared now with coronaphobia. The Karens are coming out in force. You got to wear a mask. If you're not wearing a mask, I will report you. As a, as why, why did my voice get deeper for a Karen voice? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, so 3,700 hospitalizations. Even this, so this is another number. It's very easy for them to manipulate because they can just say, well, we started testing everybody in the hospital now and we started counting people who were hospitalized with COVID even if they weren't hospitalized for COVID. So again, it's like, you know, saying, well, you know, everybody in here has, you know, H or 80% of the people in the hospital have HPV because that's what it is, sexually active general public, like is it's general warts virus. It's just out there. Man. It's, it's such a benign or minor thing. And yes, it causes cervical cancer, increased risk uh, of infertility for women. So it's not insignificant. I mean, same thing with Corona. You look at it, you go, yeah, it, it could make, you know, a few freak cases uh, of, of people just die out of the blue if you're especially vulnerable. Uh, it's going to kill some old people a little sooner than they would die otherwise. And if you're immunocompromised, it might be one little more thing that sends you over the edge. Okay, got to watch out for those things. Absolutely. But again, it's the confusion of with versus from. Are these people being hospitalized with coronavirus? or from coronavirus. And if you if you can manipulate the statistics one way or another, at any time, they can do what they're doing now. Scaring people into this, uh, with this, this myth of a, a second wave. And even from azbigmedia.com here in my home state, COVID-19 cases in Arizona increased by Single day record of 3,591. Remember, 86.34715987.6% of all statistics are made up bullshit intended to manipulate you. And this is no different right here. Single day record, totally out of context. Sounds scary. And, and if you, you know, and this is, you, you've got to look at the people who are, I, I, I I just, I hope that people learn the lessons from this and like you, you have to start letting people discredit themselves in a meaningful way. And I don't mean let them say silly crap that discredits them. I mean, like in your own mind, discredit them, tell them like, you know, you just take them out of, this is not a reliable source. News outlets that present data and statistics in headlines like this are not a reliable source. This is not a place you can go for an accurate view on the world. Uh, I mean, let me see. What, what do they even give us for context in this article? As of Tuesday, June 23, health officials reported 58,191 cases of COVID-19 and 1,384 deaths in the state. 
Uh, that is an increase of almost 20,000 new cases since last Tuesday, June 16, when the state's total was 39,097. They must be getting a lot of test kits out there. Look at all these new cases. This is good news. Oh, my gosh. Look, at we found they, they're not going because see if, if they didn't want to manipulate you, if they didn't want to scare you, this headline might read, Fatality rate of corona in Arizona drops down to less than the flu. Ha <laughs> Because we got more tests out. Like, and it's the, the de- you know, but Adam, can they fabricate the deaths? Like that's, and it's harder, but they can, especially now that it's out there. How do they fabricate coronavirus deaths? Like we saw in Washington state, which is that most poignant example a couple of weeks ago, a guy who died from a gunshot wound to the head was counted as a coronavirus death because he tested positive for coronavirus, even though his death had nothing to do with the fact that he was positive for coronavirus. So they can't fabricate them, right? And here's where they're, they're going to fail in the long run. And this is something, you know, Ron Paul pointed out. I read, you know, his article, The Coronavirus Hoax, uh, a month after I did my podcast by the same title, February 1st this year. And, you know, what he pointed out is that after a while, you're going to see as, oh, wow, coronavirus death rates went way up and up. Well, gee, regular pneumonia deaths went down. They're either going to have to start killing, like actually killing a lot more people to show an actual surge. Remember, in the United States, population, 330-something million. How many people die on a normal day? 7,500. That's your baseline across the board. 7,500 Americans die every single day. Now, our replacement rate is something like 12,000 with births and immigration. That's you know, population still grows. Within that 7,500, if it remained flat all the way across, like if we if we looked at that at that ultimate line, uh, you know, like a year from now, when we when we get these statistics, we go, hey, remember when Corona hit? Look, our death rate didn't go up at all, or there was there was like a slight bulge, right? It wasn't like, oh, oh, oh these people are dying. No, it was like not yeah, part of the normal fluctuation of American death rates. You're going to see, again, the cure being worse than the disease. More people will die as a result of the forced unemployment crisis, the economic manipulations, all those things, than from the virus itself. So, yeah, they can, they can get away with fabricating deaths for a while but it's again it's hard as mark twain i've quoted mark twain and i only know like three or four quotes for i I feel like i'm getting more that pop up in my memory as they become relevant right it's easier to convince someone that they have been lied to or it's easier to lie to someone No, no no it's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they have been fooled and that's the danger of these lies and the statistics. And you put these you put these numbers in people's heads. For those who don't read the news through these filters, it's just thousands positive, thousands dead, and they're just well, well, well you you can't tell me. I mean, how they couldn't fabricate all these? They, they don't just get dead bodies out. Right, they're not pulling dead bodies out of nowhere. They're not making things up. They're just misattributing the deaths. That's the best they can get away with. And the racket is going to fall. Uh, on its face after a while here they can only distract us with you know the the police brutality issue for so long all right so to the next story and this this is like again to the point of all of this you know what's the point of politics what's the point of government all of these rackets to keep the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer so from the hour.com this is via david lynch at the washington post IMF says global economic collapse caused by coronavirus will be even worse than fear. Now, there's a lie. Again, there's a lie in the headline. There is no global economic collapse being caused by the virus. It is being caused by the governments responding to continue their exploitation rackets. And and so I got to translate, not just point out that that's a lie. Because there's a deeper element of propaganda in this headline. Because when the IMF says, oh, yeah, the global economic collapse is going to be worse, what they're saying is (laughs) 
get ready. We have found an excuse to screw you so hard. You're you're never you're not you're never going to be able to walk again. Like you better buckle up. We are the, you know how bad things are with the economy now. We are going to make it worse, and we're going to lie to you about it and blame it on the coronavirus. And this is, again, this is my, you know, the worst possibility of that curve of tyranny going up is if they can use this as an excuse for, like, I, because remember, Jim, a few weeks ago, I was saying, like, this is the exploiters getting their their licks in and their, their last licks in and a dying exploitation racket and everybody's going oh i can i can do that thing now oh i can get on the government teat for this oh wait i'm i'm in the for i can get in on that i'll take my couple million dollar bonus and i will cover the story about hurt 16 million dollars in bonuses to executives before declaring bankruptcy you go oh okay so that's what that's what corporatism is all about right in the international monetary fund on wednesday painted a bleak portrait of the global economy, saying the coronavirus pandemic has caused more widespread damage than expected and will be followed by a sluggish recovery. We're not just going to knock you down, we're going to hold you down. The global economy will shrink this year by 4.9%, worse than the 3% decline predicted in April. No major economy is escaping the pandemic. Translation, every government around the world is getting in on this coronaphobia racket. The U.S. economy, the world's largest, is expected to shrink this year by 8%. Countries that use the single European currency are headed for a decline of more than 10%, while Japanese output will fall by 5.8%. The Chinese economy, suffering the twin ravages of the pandemic and the trade war with the U.S., is projected to eke out just a 1% gain, its worst performance in several decades. Now, again, trade war with the U.S., what's a trade war? When governments try to manipulate the economies based on trade between those countries for the benefit of their corporate sponsors and, their, and, and the banking class and all the other elites. It, you know, really, I mean, that term just, I can say piss on YouTube, right? That really pisses me off. That really... I'm sorry. I'll I'll rephrase for Peter Griffin's benefit. That really grinds my gears. Yeah, that they the, 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 this this blatant propaganda, this absurd distortion of truth is is put in the mainstream media as the accepted narrative. Current conditions are considerably more dire than the unprecedented decline in global activity that the fund projected two months ago. Since mid-April, economic data suggests even deeper downturns than previously projected. Fund officials blame the darker forecast on the effects of social distancing, scarring to global production capacity from the lockdown of activity and the productivity cost of new safety and hygiene rules. Well, gee, social distancing, did that, does that really, does, it, does that by itself really hamper economic activity? Because we already have, Oh, and, and again, it's physical distancing, not social distancing. Like, and we already have standards of social distancing. We already have respect for personal space, right? Like, and 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 touching. You know, you don't like. You, and right now, social. Or, excuse me. Pre-corona, social distancing was like three feet, right? Polite, polite talking distance with a stranger is is you know you respect their personal space. So it's kind of hard to spit on them while you're talking or breathe. Like that's, and, and that's what that comes like. It's not, you know, if, if we didn't have this, this like built in biological aversion to, to cooties, right. You know, it wouldn't be a thing, you know, and, and, and like shaking hands. I mean, wasn't it, it was, it was the Obamas. Uh, we don't shake hands anymore. We just fist bump. Okay. And like with, with handshake, like that's social distancing or physical distancing. If you want it, you know, and it, Hey, I don't, I don't, your hands are gross. I'm going to fist bump you, you know, or, or I'm in an event and I'm with hundreds of people at a random party tonight. My policy is fist bumping and keep my hand clean. There's no hand washing here. So I'm, I'm just going to, yeah, fist bump. Okay, cool. You know, and you don't go lick doorknobs, good physical distancing practice, right? So now that it's, Hey, we have this extra 
respiratory virus thing that we're worrying about on top of everything else. And now we're going to, we're going to, we're going to increase our physical distancing standards. And that's going to cause the economy to contract. No, no, it's the forced unemployment. Now, what, what else did they blame it on here? Uh, the lockdown of activity. Yeah, well, at least they're being honest with that, right? And it's it's scarring the global production capacity. I, I, I assume scarring is sorry, scarring is kind of a weird word to describe. I assume what they mean is that it's scarring. Like there's going to be permanent damage, right? There are going to be some facilities that, that just don't come back online, or at least uh, not the way they were before. Uh, productivity cost of new safety and hygiene rules. Well, all right, there they're blaming it on the rules. So that's 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 mm -hmm. nice that that's not they could have lied even worse, right? But no, it's at least they're being pretty clear about this. Some economies are also still struggling to control the coronavirus, the fund added without naming specific governments, of course. Yeah, again, deliberate FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt, confusion. You are easier to exploit. When you're in that state of mind. So what's the response to this? Really exciting to see from the independent. Herd immunity music festival to take place in July against the advice of medical experts. As humans, we need other human contact, wrote the event organizers. Oh, so if you were pissed off about my little corona party in Michigan a few months ago. <laughs> I guess I was just way ahead of my time. The world's first herd immunity festival set to take place next month, going against the advice of medical experts. Music events worldwide have been canceled to limit the spread of coronavirus. But the three-day-long festival in Ringle, Wisconsin, in the U.S., plans to go ahead in July. Included among the herd immunity fest performers are artists such as Static X, Nonpoint, Dope, Boba Flex, and Royal Bliss. Described as a mini man, I know I'm not one of the cool kids. I know Static X. Okay. I, di I didn't. I mean, maybe those are like smaller bands around Static X. I like Static X. They got some good stuff. Uh, good, good, you know, good, good rebellious energy. Uh, very appropriate for for such a concert. Described as a mini fest, the event will take place outdoors at the QNZ Expo Center. Promotion for the event makes no mention of social distancing measures. On Facebook, one of the events organizers wrote, when the lockdown first happened, my first thought was, okay, we can all do two weeks. Then it went on and on. Things were getting canceled. I started to worry about people, not only for this COVID, but mental, physical, and financial. As humans, we need other human contact. Music in itself is great, but the live streams, as I am sure you all know, is just not the same. We need live, feel it to the bones, run shivers of your spine, music with people around us takes us all the way on a trip that unless you have felt it you won't understand now i'm i'm i like a, if if we had a, a proper system for dealing with the coronavirus and we decided that we wanted to kind of go with herd immunity like there would be a and, and this is this is like a you know legitimate theory like i'm not weighing in on it one way or another but if the only threat of the virus is to elderly and immunocompromised and for, for, for 95 plus percent of the rest of us, it's, you don't even experience any symptoms or very mild cold. You would think that like in a, in a vaccine for this, now I'm, you know, has it, I'm worried about, you know, obviously if we had a free market, we wouldn't have the kind of messed up vaccines. Man, it was really hard not to say fricked up vaccine system that we have today. It would be really hard, you know, to 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 have it as as corrupt and evil as it is. And and vaccines in and of themselves, you know, they it, it's it's good science, right? I mean, the problem with vaccines as we know them today is is through government and corporate corruption, not from the science of vaccines, right? And I'm like, and it's the same thing with GMOs. GMOs themselves, I mean, hypothetically, every domesticated animal is a, a genetically modified organism in and of itself, or even the, even the, the Frankenfruit stuff. It's not that it's that there's no liability for people misusing this technology. Same thing with vaccines. So we, we might be able to get a good vaccine that's safe and reliable and get it out there. And then everybody's immune. And it's no big deal. Right. Um, 
but even if that's if that's not the case, and I think I think if, if we had that incentivized, you'd see uh, right now uh, you, there, there's a certain amount of entrepreneurial energy in the world, right? Uh, of people going, "Where's the need? What can what can I make a million dollars by figuring out a new way to meet everybody's ne- unmet needs more effectively, more efficiently than they're being met today?" And and like even with the test kits, right? And we were so close. When I got my coronavirus test kit, it was smuggled into the country illegally, which is illegally imported, I guess. Uh, not necessarily smuggled, <laughs> but uh, they, they were like they were about to get FDA approval to uh, distribute to sell a home coronavirus test kit. You prick your finger, put it on a, and yeah, that's it. And then the FDA said no. This and this was because. Possibly Trump's directive to say, no, we need to slow the testing down. So that entrepreneurial energy is not able to be manifest in reality as actual goods and services. Because like, Jim, if you're thinking like for us, you know, I mean, we're, we're thinking, you know, we're sitting here going, well, you know, we're going to be entrepreneurs. What, what could we do to meet people's needs? Well, you know, and we go, well, let's make greenhouses. Let's sell people greenhouse kits. Like we can do that. Right. But if we had the ability to make, a vaccine or to make these test kits that, that are, yeah, like, and, and if, if we like, I, I know it's like a bit of an extreme manufacturing leap here for the garden of freedom. If we, yeah. but, if, but the, the, the test kits themselves, they're not hard to make. They're very cheap. They're not complicated. Like if, if Jim and I said, well, really the best way for us to make money as entrepreneurs by legitimately serving others, meeting real human needs. We're like, well, shit. I mean, shite. We could, we, we could, I mean, crap. We could, we, we could, I don't want to be censored in in, in, uh, in Scotland either. Uh, we, so, you know, we, we, crap, we can't, well, we could make these, and, and if we made these test kits, we could make millions of dollars. But, you know, we're not even going to try because you can look ahead, you can anticipate as an entrepreneur and say, nah, Government's going to get in the way of this. There's too much red tape, and they could kill this business at any time. Why? Why would we do that? And so there's now there's this huge unmet need, and you go, why? Because government disincentivizes entrepreneurs, and it's shown time and again they will they'll just eh, waste your effort completely because they feel like it because of their corporate sponsors to maintain their power racket, whatever the case may be. So we not only would we possibly have you know the, the bulletproof vaccine everybody gets it it's totally safe reliable you know maybe if you're elderly or immunocompromised it, you know you have to get it under supervision because you know you get you get a piece of the virus you know you might have an you know response to the vaccine it's possible okay but we get that and if we didn't get that we'd have a way to give everybody the virus who wanted it honestly and, and if this is like if we knew right if we were sharing information as a human family without government standing in the way, like Trump asking the CDC to conduct deliberations in, in, in secret. You know, who was, who was just mad at? But if we knew what the virus was, right, reliably, and we say, yes, it has a, you know, it, it, it's, it's less deadly than the flu. Uh, it has, you know, these properties. And we can screen you and see, are you at risk? And I would go into the one of these facilities. I go to my, or maybe I just go to my, I go to the VA. I go to a doctor and say, uh, and they say, okay, Adam, you want the, uh, you want the, you want to get coronavirus so you can get over it. Okay, cool. Uh, so you're, you're, you're gonna give you a health screen. Oh, you're 38 years old. Um, we're gonna do some blood work before we give you the coronavirus. We're gonna do some blood work and make sure that you're in this because we can know of people who pass our screening. If we give you the virus. Your fatality rate is 0.0001. It's, it's freakishly insignificant. I mean, we can say with almost 100% scientific certainty that if, 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 you're, if you're not elderly or immunocompromised or have any of these other conditions, we do your blood work, we, take, we give you a physical, we give you the coronavirus, say, hey, by the way, now you need to wear a mask until you test negative. And then you go, and that's what these masks are really for, right? And there's a lot of misperception about the masks, you know, that they're protecting you. No, no, no. 
It's limiting your, the only thing that the mask is legitimately doing in, in, in protection of any kind of, yeah, I mean, maybe you're slightly less likely to touch your face if you touch it. Well, as good as a reminder, if you're afraid of getting it and you're going out and you're, you're not confident, you're hand washing, not touching your face ability. Okay, a mask might be a little help that way, but it's, it's, it's limiting the, the particulates. And so, the, you know, the, the guidelines, even from the federal government, even from Fauci, at one point, all oh, they've changed or, you know, the only people who should be wearing masks are those who have tested positive or are actively sneezing and coughing. And if you're not, don't bother because it's actually more detrimental to your health. And now I'm like, oh, man, when are the, well, I'm, I'm waiting, you know, the, in a month or two. The cure is worse than the disease stories are going to get overwhelming and you're going to see a lot. Of, oh, people that had consequences from the, the, the paranoia, the stress hormones, the uh, economic hardship, all of that. So we could do this like we could we could get over this. We get to this practical herd, herd immunity and, and get over this one way or another. Right. Or we could test. And like we saw in some cases, and this is, of course, according to the official mainstream government narratives. Oh, well, South Korea did a very good job of testing and contact tracing. They were, well, OK, well, then why can't we do that? Because government and that because that, that would end this whole thing. Right. If you if you do the. Testing and contact tracing you know, excessively and you get a handle on it and the new cases get, get down to insignificant and then you're just in the back into, okay, well, here's the new normal. There's another virus in the global human family Petri dish. And if we deal with it like the flu in this country now, because there's, you know, we, we, we've got the procedure and it's, it's tamped down enough. But no, we don't, we don't get any of these even basic things for handling this, this very minor health crisis probably because of the government intervention. So back to the story. The herd immunity theory posits that allowing the virus to spread through the population encourages people to quickly develop immunity, becoming less likely than to pass the virus on to others. It has been disputed by many medical experts and has been rejected as a pandemic strategy in countries across Europe. And that is what, you know, you know this is where I go, really. Uh, this is this is bad journalism. This is uh, boot looking journalism right here. What do they do? And this is the independent. Not very independent, if you ask me. If they would say, hey, the herd immunity is this, right? And then say, it has been disputed by many medical experts, has been rejected as a pandemic strategy in countries across Europe. No, no for just this kind of vague, well, you know, this is this is probably stupid and silly because, you know, governments uh, in Europe, now, again, Rejected as a pandemic strategy in countries across Europe, maybe more accurate is by governments across Europe. And so, you know, I talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago, the, the silver lining of all of this economic suppression being an explosion in the black market or, or a further bifurcation of the economy. And I'd like to de de develop this idea a little bit more it's not like there's a white market which is really the red market the violent bloody government war everything corporatism fiat currency market and the black market <clears throat> it's you know, like these are separate things right we talk about the gray market as if it's this separate category you know a mix of white and black and maybe that's maybe it's important to include just that in what i'm talking about here because i see this kind of kind of like a venn diagram Right. Maybe the gray market is the overlap of these circles of the white market and the black market. Makes sense. Right. That's why it's gray. It's black and it's white at the same time. It's a mix. So if you've got this this, this gray market growing as well, there's this whole other thing. This is this battleground in the middle. And. You know, I've heard the, the, the silly quote to encourage activists. You know, those of us who care about peace must be as diligent in organizing as those who want war. And we never will be. We don't have the budget. We're just the ones going, hey, a-holes. <laughs> Is art so if I say arse on YouTube, am I gonna get censored in the UK? Is that is that bollocks? Anyway, so if 
or if you have this battleground in the middle, I think it's really important for those of us who care about freedom to encourage people to make that move. You know, and yesterday, based on Jim's mom's dream, we, uh, you know, came up with this better analogy rather than, you know, for, for helping statists as, as libertarian actors that we're, we're showing them the way out of buildings that are collapsing. You can stay in the building if you want. You can stay in the red market. You can stay in the violent red slash white market. You can keep playing this game. Or you can follow us into the woods out of the cities where there's plenty of freedom to go around to a new lifestyle, to a more conscientious lifestyle. You don't have to be a part of the system. You don't have to. This, this new normal, They again, the people who want the white market to be the dominant one, they don't want you to know this. They want to paint a picture for you very carefully. This is the new normal, and you have to accept it. Don't mind the man behind the curtain. Don't man the man and mind the man in front of the curtain in Ash Fork either. Because this illusion is how they trick you. Again, it's like holy Kleenex is Batman. It was right under our noses and we blew it. Someone stole my freedom. Oh, it was right here all along. All you have to do is see the world accurately for what it is and choose a lifestyle of freedom. If anything, in all the ways that government is losing its grip on the new normal, I think living free is more possible, practical, and satisfying than ever before. So now we have some sort of just a series of kind of need to know stories from the hour.com, Trump family seeks to block a book by president's niece that calls him world's most dangerous man. From Mary L. Trump, PhD. You gotta put the PhD on the cover there for credibility. Too much and never enough. How my family created the world's most dangerous man. President Donald Trump's brother on Tuesday petitioned a New York court to block the publication of a book by Mary Trump that describes her uncle, President Donald Trump, as the world's most dangerous man. Pre-sales of the book, scheduled for publication on July 28th, have soared to the top of bestseller lists on the basis of a description from publisher Simon & Schuster that it will reveal decades of family secrets, including a nightmare of traumas that explain the psychology of the man who is now president. Hmm. Now I'm intrigued. I mean, I've just, as a psychology buff in general, you know, I have a brain. I like to know how it works. I appreciate how I know other people's brains works. I think everybody should be a, a fan of psychology, at least at that level. But on my undergrads in psychology and feeling, I was understanding I, developmental psychology was, was part of what I studied and seeing how this uh, developmental trauma could create Trump. You go, oh, but you know what's exciting about this? You might finally get the ammo to actually get under Trump's skin. Now, I wonder, with, with, with an effort to suppress a book like this, they know about the Streisand effect. Like, and with this one, I go, wait, well, and, you know, like the John Bolton book that's in, in the process of coming out right now that they're also... Uh, Trump administration then taking you know, legal action to, to try to suppress in, in various ways. It's like they know that this is calling more attention to it, right? Or is it is it at the point where these are big national stories and it's too late? I, I mean, I probably would have ignored this. Like, if it, I would not have heard about the, I would have heard about the book. I'm guessing. Like, okay, the book comes out. I'm going to hear about it. Oh, yeah, there's that. I'd, prob I'd probably re read some highlights, like like with the Bolton book. But even then, with the Bolton book, I haven't, like, I, I would have waited until it was released and there had been some reviews and I would have picked one. 
<clears throat> they gave me the best sort of summary, you know, shows me the highlights, you know, give me the clip notes. So I, don't, I don't have to read the whole book because I, I don't want to be distracted by the drama. Do I, do I care? Like, does it help me remove the knife from the back of society that is government to study the blade and the pommel and the design? And no, you get it out. So, like, again, this is like, I feel, oh, I feel icky already. Like, oh, I'm getting into Trump psychology here. And it's like, same, so same thing with this. Maybe, you know, but now, I, now I'm like, ooh, now maybe, maybe I do want to actually read this one myself and get into it and go, oh. So that's the backstory there. And I think because, you know, we call him Cheeto Jesus because he's orange and expects to be worshipped. And we call him Cadet Bone Spurs because he's a military worshiper who dodged the draft using Bone Spurs as the excuse, which in and of itself I support. I don't support him worshiping the military. I don't support the hypocrisy of this. Uh, I, I support uh, uh, draft dodging. I support you know, not, not going and killing people for politicians if they're trying to force you to do it. Yeah, good. Get out of it. Be like Muhammad Ali and be proud of it. Not ashamed of it like Trump, Cadet Bone Spurs. Who knows what other great nicknames are going to come out of this childhood expose that we might be getting here. So I don't know. We'll be. I'm looking. I'm looking forward to this. And because now that I think about it, these two books that they're fighting, this isn't a deliberate Streisand effect kind of thing. I think Trump's done that before. I mean, I'm trying to think of a good example. Like, uh, I mean, his inauguration, or they, they lied about the numbers, and maybe it was like, oh, we'll just call attention. That's not really a good Streisand effect example. The Streisand effect is, you know, you try to suppress something. And the act of suppressing it calls more attention to it as a as a whiplash effect. So, if Trump would do that, like I think there's a deliberate use of the strike, like like Candace Owens, right, or or who was it <coughs> used to work for Trump? So one of his aides, who he, he, okay, oh, um, well, like Roger Stone, right. Here's a good example. Saw Roger Stone in the news today as well. Some criticism of him being favored in, in the justice because he's got because he's a friend of Trump. No, he's set up for, pers- for prosecution because of what he did for Trump in the first place. So, no, nah, that's kind of silly. But, um, you know, when Stone left the campaign, he said he quit. Trump said he fired him. And they kept talking about it for, for like weeks. That was deliberate. There was a, you know, and it was like, hey, you, there might have been some Streisand effect of, hey, we don't want to talk about this. This is internal stuff. But by the way, he said that he quit, and I said I fired him. Well, now I have to pay attention to that, right? So we'll see. I'm going to be following these, you know, one of, the, one of those threads. I'm going to keep going behind the scenes, watching both of these books, waiting. You know, if I see a, a good summary, I'll, 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 you know, if someone wants to send me one to read on the air when it's come out or, you know, there's probably one already for the Bolton book. I, I don't like taking oh the mainstream media headlines we've seen so far about the Bolton book. But anyway, from Yahoo.com. Trump campaigns on border wall progress. There's not much of it by Eli Eli Stokels at LA Times. President Trump, whose plans to campaign on a booming economy were ruined by the coronavirus, traveled Tuesday to the southern edge of Arizona to highlight completion of more than 200 miles of powerful border wall with Mexico. He didn't mention the fine print. Nearly all 216 miles built since Trump took office replaced outdated or dilapidated fencing. Only about three miles of new border wall system have been constructed in locations where no barriers previously existed. So when he says completion of more than 200 miles of powerful border wall the lie here is that it's really completion of their repairs. Pretty big lie. Pretty big lie when you understand it that, oh, yeah, we were, we, uh, we repaired that uh, the couple miles of fence there. 
we completed a couple miles of fence there. Oh, by completed, I meant complete the repairs. Mm-hmm. Sure. No, this is a, that's a big, I mean, even by Trump standards, it's a big, blatant lie. And I wonder, like, I, I want to know, you know, among Trump supporters right now, like, is this is this like a silver bullet? Are people going, oh, yeah, you couldn't even get that done? Is he going to blame that on Corona? We'll see. You know, I think I, I, I'm looking forward to, to, to Joe Jorgensen at a debate with Trump and Biden going, yeah, you said you were going to do this and then and you didn't. And then you lied about it. I just to see this called out nationally. Trump repeatedly pledged during and after his 2016 campaign that he'd make Mexico pay for a big, beautiful wall on the entire 1,954-mile border. So far, the Trump administration has spent $15 billion on the project. Mexico has not contributed anything. And this is where Trump is going to say, well, no, no, we, we've, got, we've got illegal immigrants paying taxes, and if you add up all of that, we make, well, we, you know, we're mad we're Mexico. No. There's, there's some, and we've accepted this. So, you know, you, you all know me in terms of having, you know, a more positive worldview and, and, and really always looking at the, you know, bigger dynamics, the, the, the course of human progress and, you know, where things are going. And there, there, you know, even, even with that, like, is Trump the worst president? No, Trump, you know, again, you know, again I'll give Trump credit where it's due. You know, as, as, as Trump increased the viciousness of America's foreign policy? I don't think so. If anything, I think he, he's, he's, he's continued the general trend and the decline in that. Right? Yeah. So if that's the case, then I'm not saying this to say, oh my gosh, Trump is terrible. It's a step backwards. But you know what? There is one thing. There is one thing about Trump that really does represent a major step backwards for America and for humanity. And for the people who, who follow him, who previously had a higher standard of, of integrity, of, of intellectual integrity. Um, are, are you really going to sit there and, and tell me that Donald Trump isn't a liar? And then he's created this system around him with his base where they excuse all of the lies. That was a joke. Oh, yeah, I was just joking. Oh, I meant this. Oh, yeah, I just went down to the bunker to inspect it. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Well, we had more people at my inauguration than any other inauguration in history. Well, it's time to reject this one way or another. And I've endorsed Joe Biden, libertarian nominee for president. No questions there. And I don't think Biden would be meaningfully different than Trump. But really, if, if he wins or Joe wins, I will celebrate a return to a little more intellectual integrity or a higher standard of that in our conversation. Because the people who have been trained, the Trumpa Loompas, the Trumpa Files, the, I don't know, what, what do we call them? The worshipers of Orange Jesus. Uh, Cheeto Jesus. We had we didn't we have more good ones. The uh, oh Trumpy Dumpties. Yeah. The Storm Trumpers. They, they got to give this up without Trump. This constant excuse for lying by government officials. But Trump especially, and I'm I'm really excited one way or another to move past. This era of Trump, where even just covering the news includes deconstructing Trump's lies on a daily basis and going, no, he's lying about this. Although there is one big silver lining here. Never before 
as the American federal government, as it does now under Trump, have had so little credibility. Jim, do we have some comments to check in on here now that we're a little over halfway through the show? Got through some good headlines. Got a few. We got a bunch of quick need to know ones before we get to emotional freedom. But let's check in. I want you to set the record straight right quick. A couple of people are confused that think that you just endorsed Biden. So make it perfectly clear. No, okay. no, no, no. You know what? Screw you. Screw it. And, you know, if there are people in our on in our audience playing this troll game. No. I can say nice things about someone without endorsing them. I can agree with somebody on one thing and not on all other things. How can that is so intellectually dishonest for anyone to claim that unless they honestly misheard me. I said right before I said something nice about Biden that I've endorsed Joe Jorgensen for president. Yeah. Well, Adam, you said a nice thing about a communist once. Are we sure that you're not a communist communist sympathizer? No. This is the same thing that people try to play with me with Chaz Chop. Like, I gotta want. Are, are there people really watching the live show for the sake of making those kinds of stupid comments? Now, hold on. As bad as Biden is, and Biden is as evil as anybody else in politics, and in, in, I should say in the, in the old parties, because you can be libertarian and not be evil and be still in politics. Yeah, Biden is as evil as anybody, else, even as evil as Trump. All I was saying, you want your clarification, is that Trump has a uniquely detached view of reality and an ability to lie and lie about lying and excuse lies and make lies on lies on lies is more excuses. And it's an aggravator for those of us who care about intellectual integrity on top of all the other aggravators of the system. And I'll say nice things about Trump. And oh my God, Adam's endorsing Trump. Oh, like, you know, Trump, as I said just now, hasn't bucked the general trend of American foreign policy becoming less deadly, less vicious. Yeah, and that's more important to me than the lying thing. That's way more important. I mean, if Biden escalates militarily abroad, oh, I'm going to be all over him way worse for that than Trump being a liar. Trust me. But I will be relieved if Biden wins, that I don't have this uh, unique, extra aggravating layer of bullcrap from Trump and all of his apologists, the, the Trump Loompas and the, the Trumpy Dumpters and the Trumpy, yeah. Trumpy Dumpsters, the Trumpster Fire setters. Yeah, like, yeah, this, no, I'm, I'm, I will be relieved when Trump's standard of dishonesty is just no longer a thing in America. That would be nice. So, uh, moving on to comments. Um, what was it? Draco Chainmail. He was saying, my parents made me play with the chicken pox infected kid up the street to make me catch it. LOL. Oh, well. And you're talking about yeah. getting me a movie. Yeah, movie. I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Good follow on. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's already a thing. Chicken pox parties, parents you know, send their kids. And then, you know, it's because it's. I, now I want to see. Now I want to look up what's the mortality rate of chicken pox. No oh boy. I guess it's fatality rate. So if you put in what is. Okay, so like if you go into Google, what is the fatality rate of coronavirus and rate of influenza come up first? Fatality rate of chicken pox. I bet it's, but it's higher than uh, than coronavirus. Uh, let's see symptoms and causes. Well, this sort of goes into the next mm -hmm. comment too. Is related. Jeremy Gooding on Facebook. This is probably a lot to hope for, but does there exist any reliable source that tallies the actual daily death tolls in America? Is there no? A source you no, because you can't. Right. Because there's there's no aggregator that's able to investigate every single every one. Single, yeah. Because you, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, maybe eventually you could. I, you know, someone's probably doing this. So I, I take it back. I don't. I don't mean to. I don't know. Then I don't mean to suggest because I don't know it doesn't exist. Right. But um, that uh, 
someone is is going through this and you know looking at hold on I'm, dude i pulled up mortality and it doesn't i can't fit it, it, it's it's taking those out of these results anyway i'll get to this but uh what were we talking about uh we chicken were, pox oh before that no, after that um the reliable source of death toll okay so yeah death toll someone's probably so if I, I hope someone is out there analyzing the American death tolls and, 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 and separating ones that we know are with Corona as opposed to from Corona. But then there's going to be a lot of unknowns. And the reason I, I don't think we, we're going to have good data uh, like immediately for this is that a lot of if, 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 if like where do you go you think about it? hey what's right now who's reporting the death tolls like state governments from hospitals in their state right and if you're trying to get the national data how far down to the individual level are you even able to get can you get the medical records of someone to even tease out like the gunshot one with that, that only came out because someone caught them, right? Who knew about the individual case, who knew that that guy got shot and was like, wait a second. They saw his name on a list of coronavirus deaths or something like that. So they probably stopped publishing the names for protecting people's privacy reasons because, you know, HIPAA and all that. We care about your rights all of a sudden when it could benefit us in, you know, hiding what's really going on here. You're only going to get. Even in, in you know in those medical records, you're gonna get very narrow statistics. Um, you, you're gonna have someone is gonna have to get in, and I don't, I don't think you could keep up with it right now. I mean, you need a team. I hope someone's got a research team ready to go that they can just sort of like you know put on this problem, assigned to this task. Um, it's, it's like a nice luxury if you got a lot of money sitting around. I mean, if I was if I was super wealthy here, I'd just be like, oh yeah, let's hire ten people. To do our our coronavirus statistical, you know, reanalysis program and and prove that these death counts are are bullshit. Things right now you can't. You know, we have these. You have to extrapolate, and I guess to a certain extent you could extrapolate now, right? If, if how many? What are they saying? What, what's the death count in the U.S. now? Like over a hundred thousand, so, a hundred some thousand. That's, first of all, that's a lot of individual records. That's a, that's a ma like just collecting that data, let alone processing it. As something that's ongoing, there's more data coming. You know, where do you where do you start? You start, you just try to try to catch up with the with the present. It's gonna be really hard. But if you if you look at like say of those hundred thousand cases, you're somehow able to get a legitimately random sample of a thousand. And you're able to show that, you know, of those thousand, only only ten percent of them clearly died from coronavirus. Then you can say, okay, whatever we thought the mortality rate is, now we need to take it down by, you know, a factor of ten. And uh, that would be that would be really nice if we could get to that. So prognosis for chickenpox in adult in adults, the disease is more severe, though the incidence is much less common. Infection in adults is associated with Greater morbidity and mortality due to pneumonia, either direct viral pneumonia or secondary bacterial bronchitis, hepatitis, and cephalitis. In particular, up to 10% of pregnant women with chickenpox develop pneumonia, the severity of which increases with onset later in gestation. So this is why they want you to do this. This is why, like, again, just the, the immunity part, right? Why do they want you to get it when you're young? Because it's harmless when you're young. That's the nature of this uh, of chickenpox. We already have a proxy for this. And what do we do? We make sure that kids get it. And you just accept, hey, if you don't get it, I mean, is this, I, I don't know, if someone wants to tell me, like, is this still the modern practice? Someone wants to maybe look this up and we'll get back into the headlines here. You know, if your kid doesn't get chickenpox by age, whatever, then you take them to a party and try to make sure that they get it, right? Is it, I don't know if that's still the practice, if it's still common, but it wasn't a big deal. I mean, if if you have a practically zero percent chance of dying of coronavirus right now, or if you're you know under sixty, 
But if you're over 60, now you have a, you know, one or 2% chance of dying from it. Well, hey, eliminate that chance. Get it now. Get it out of the way. Not a big deal. But no, we have to shut down all the schools, make sure the kids don't get it so they can spread slower. I have a feeling that where this is going, eventually the science will catch up with coronavirus one way or another. Eventually we'll figure this out. Um, but think about it too. If you want your kids to be able to go visit their grandparents, do you want them every time they go visiting their grandparents to have to suit up? Or do you want them to, hey, go to a corona party, make sure we test, we'll make sure you test positive, and then we'll make sure you test negative. And now you can never be a carrier ever again, ever in your life. The market finds efficiency natural, which is more efficient, worrying about a mask and gloves and all that other nonsense, distancing for the rest of our lives, or no, we're going to get it now and we're going to be able to get it over. But we can't, literally cannot, because government is standing in the way of people taking that possibility or exploring that strategy. Honestly, like I said before, like I said earlier in the show, if you could, if you could, you know, have me uh, administer me with the virus itself, uh, you know, under re reliable medical supervision where they've got some accountability for if they screw up, they've got insurance at least. Then, yeah, give me the virus. Let me get it over with. Who knows what we'd be capable of <clears throat> technology wise without government in the way. Flus might become the same thing, like with vaccines. Or just, we might be able to administer the flu in a way. I mean, how cool would it be like, hey, we're going to give you every flu virus known to man. In a controlled environment, you're, you're, you might get a little sick for two weeks, but then you will never get the flu again ever in your life. Money I'd sign up for that. Money back guarantee. <laughs> yeah right. If he does, yeah, there you go. Money back guarantee. If he does positive for this, I'm hey, I'm just I'm just dreaming here, Jim. Like I'm not saying, like just from what I know of molecular biology, what I know of modern science, what I know of the scientific method, what I know of current medical technology. I know that we're capable of way more than what we're doing because government is standing in the way of the implementation of so many of these amazing technologies. But you can, Jim, just look like. Where are we today, even with government, where are we today versus where we were 20 years ago? Very, very far. Nine day, and, and, you know, we might, we'd be a lot further if it was without government. So all I'm doing is even, even with or without government, I'm just envisioning, you know, where we might be five to 10 years in the future. And like I said, I, I don't think government will be able to fully suppress all of these relevant technologies around coronavirus. If, if what I'm saying is possible, right? Somebody's going to step up and do it. Somebody's going to find a way, and it might, it might, it might take years because it might be in a different country first, right? And odds are, given that America is uh, land of the not very free anymore, if it works. We'll ban it. They'll be, yeah, they'll ban. It. But you'll be like, imagine you can go to a different country. People will do like the Corona spa vacation. Well, you go, you do your screen, you get injected with corona, you go sit in a hotel, spa, space where everybody has it for two weeks, and then you come home, and or you come home when you test negative. But, you know, it would be so much easier if you could just do it at home and not have to leave the country. I mean, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, well, there's like a lot of medical procedures. And right now, the, the example of this, or examples are in plastic surgery, you know, boob jobs, cosmetic facial reconstruction. Uh, things like that, all sorts of other, you know, cosmetic type implants or elective surgeries. People go to Thailand. It's called medical tourism. You know, just because in the United States, you pay for this ridiculous overhead. And, and now, hey, we have doctors who are just as reliable over here. And you don't have to pay for the American military industrial complex, taxation, banking system, warfare state and surveillance state, police state while you're buying your fake boobies. You can just buy fake boobies without having to subsidize all that other crap and go to Thailand and, and or, you know, there, there are other places where this happens. And it's just, well, gee, this is the consequence of making things too expensive in the United States. Really, for anybody who's considering anything like this or, or any major purchase, you got to. And this is so dumb. But if you're if you're a modern citizen of the empire living in the United States, 
you know, even buying a car or something else to say, oh, yeah, maybe importing, maybe doing it from somewhere else or maybe going somewhere else where it might be a lot more effective or efficient. Do we have any guesses for our clip today? We have one person who guessed two wrong guesses. How do you know they were wrong? Oh, because you saw the video on, the, on your phone. Okay, so Jim knows the answer. They guess Gilbert Godfrey. Yeah, yeah, right. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it was two voices, by the way, in that clip. I apologize. So it was supposed to be the second one who's the, the, the famous part. But the, the scene where it happened, what they're talking about, really, <clears throat> excuse me, even if you, if you Googled the terms that you heard in that clip, you could have figured it out. It might, it might have been a little little challenging as opposed to just, you know, do I recognize it? Did I replay it for him? Well, let's play a little more. Why don't, why don't you pull it up? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll play the last part of what I played in, in a little bit more. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll creep into the part that's that's really famous here. So we'll go back to the volume up. There we go. Listen to most people. There's no volume. Be bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, a human being. Ah! The operation of the machine becomes the audience. Make yourself sick at heart. All right, that's the part, sort of the famous part. Did you recognize that, Jim? No. No? I was Someone must have recognized that. All right. Yeah. All right, if nobody guesses it, by the, well, either way, we'll play the rest of the clip at the end of the show. It's one of my favorite speech clips of all time. And 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 what it's it's just a few lines. And you can hear the speaker there. And in the clip we've played before, they're talking about university policies, obviously. And he's saying, you know, you can't treat us like commodities. We're people. And then uh, it's... It, it, this this incredible call to action that really has echoed through the through the decades since. So there's another big clue, right? There's video of this, but decades ago, and it was obviously this, so this was black and white era to give you that clue. And uh, I studied this in protest movements in college. Do we give people another clue? I feel like I want to give them one more. Probably, yeah, I would. Because I don't. I it, obviously <clears throat> it's still cricket. All right, we'll say, okay, this is from the 60s. No, this is not Ludwig von Mises. This is, so this is, this is from the 60s. Uh, th these are students at a university. And it's connected to their, their cause that they're talking about here is very much connected to the Vietnam War, the, the anti-war movement, but very specifically around uh, the student movement around that. That was beyond just being anti-war, but also for a lot more uh, social reforms beyond that. All right, so let's get into some more headlines. From cbsnews.com, massive Sahara dust plume drifting towards the United States. Who had who had giant African dust plume for, for, for June? Was that, was that you on the Apocalypse of the there. Month event? Uh, do you, Pool here? Did you did you pick that? Okay, well, congratulations for those of you who picked massive plume of dust from the Sahara Desert in northern Africa. It has been traversing the atmosphere thousands of feet above the tropical Atlantic Ocean and is now cloaking the Caribbean and closing in on the southeastern United States. While summer dust plumes are a common occurrence, this appears to be one of the most extreme in recent memory. It's so large it has been nicknamed the Gorilla Dust Cloud. Because, you know, gorillas are like, is this, you know, this is the most significant event in the past 50 years. Conditions are dangerous in many Caribbean islands, according to Pablo Mendez Lazaro from the University of Puerto Rico School of Public Health. On satellite images from space, dust typically appears somewhat subtle and faint, but this plume can be seen as clear as day. The picture below was taken on Sunday from the International Space Station. We flew over the Saharan dust plume today in the West Central Atlantic. Amazing how large an area it covers. Astronaut Doug Hurley tweeted, these plumes of Saharan dust termed Saharan air layer by meteorologists are whipped up by strong windstorms crossing the Sahara Desert. 
The dust enters the Atlantic Ocean near the Cape Verde Islands inside the intertropical convergence zone where tropical systems often get their start. NOAA's GOES satellite captured this series of animating images on Friday as the dust entered the deep tropical uh, Atlantic from Africa. The dust hitches a ride along the trade winds, a belt of east to west moving winds near the equator, which become firmly established during summertime. The dust layer can extend from a few thousand feet above the surface to 20,000 feet up. Wow. While the dust masses often stay generally intact during most of the transatlantic journey, they typically become diffuse and diluted by the time they reach the Caribbean. However, so far, this particular dust layer is define the odds. Now, I, I, you know, this makes me think of the dust out here, right? Where we, you know, it's, it's a little windy here in the mountains and uh, it's, you know, where we don't, we don't have trees like we do here so nicely. It's, it's, it gets dusty. And here, you know, where we have our roads, our driveways on the property and, and other areas that have been cleared in this area, you know, it's, it's dustier than it is where we have vegetation. And this is basic terraforming. You know, and 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 landscaping. You know, and 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 when I think of like this global warming thing, you know, again the George Carlin bit. This planet doesn't care about us. It's gonna shake us off like a bad case of fleas when we're done, or when it's when it's done with us. And I just think of like all the positive things, even from, uh, well, I I don't know about cloud seeding, right? Geoengineering and uh, chemtrails. You guys knew we were going to work. We we're talking about a dust plume. We we're going to talk about chemtrails. You guys knew that, right? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little more. It's just, I, I, I'm kind of like with cloud seeding and and uh, geoengineering, like like with GMOs. It's being done secretly in a really messed up way, and it's experimenting on people where we're being hurt by the the the, the, the toxins involved in this. We don't know everything they're spraying and what they do spray to manipulate the weather is toxic and dangerous and needs to be done with transparency and accountability for everyone involved, right? Then at this whole other level, like we talk about, you know, uh, you know, global warming, because there's too much, there's you know, too much CO2, you know, um, right? Like carbon dioxide and not uh, emissions from burning fossil fuels primarily, right? Uh, all of them, uh, you know, human industrial activity, not enough oxygen. Well, how do you get more? And it's, oh, it's because it's because we're, we're, we're burning fossil fuels and we're burning down trees. We have massive deforestation issues in, in the rainforest, uh, in, in, in areas all over the country, excuse me, all over the world. And, you know, and some of the things that I've studied about terraform or about, about homesteading was terraforming where people take, and you can look at places in the desert in, in Africa, where with with not a lot of effort, they're able to take raw desert and, and turn it into an, an oasis just by the way they collect the dirt, you know, the way they move the water around. You know, and, and I think like of all the positive things we could be doing with uh, landscaping, <laughs> to put it in you know the mildest term, but you know, how, like a Let's let's plant gardens all over the Sahara and, and, and irrigate it so that we have plants growing. We don't have this dust problem anymore. Like with that, I I don't like I, this just off the top of my head during the show. I didn't plan this segment or like think about all this in advance. I didn't actually plan talking about chemtrails either. But just think of what we would be capable of if if the massive resources that government has used to to for war, uh, you know, even this the inefficiency. Of like even now, like even here talking like with Peter and Helen and other people at the property and you know, they're just talking to people who are involved with the show. There's how much time are people spending right now? I don't want to I, I I my little caricature phrase is we're spending so much time filling out government forms that we're not getting anything, and it's not literally filling out government forms, but how like you only have so much energy. So many hours in a day. And if instead of going, gee, how could I, how could I be productive? How could I meet other people's needs? How could I serve humanity? You're going, oh shit, which government program do I sign up for? Is my government check here yet? Did I get my next government check? Oh. So much possible productive energy is diverted to 
things that are unproductive, like on a massive scale. I mean, war, death, all of that really, I think that's the, the biggest, obviously the banking industry manipulation, creating huge misallocations of resources. Again, like, like with the coronaphobia thing where there's a demand, like there are people going, hey, this dust sucks. Do we do something about this? Like, hey, this is really affecting, you know, our, our quality of life somewhere else. You know, the impact on health from this. The dust was so thick that the Barbados Meteorological Services issued a severe dust haze warning urging residents to take action due to significantly reduced visibility and potential respiratory problems for people who experience difficulty breathing. You think about like Beijing with, with the pollution there, just clouds of smog. Yeah, government creating a health hazard. NASA satellites measure the intensity of dust, dust clouds with a metric called aerosol optical thickness. This metric indicates the degree to which aerosols prevent the transmission of light through the atmosphere. 0.01 indicates crystal clear skies. 0.4 corresponds with very hazy conditions. And a 4 means the pollution is so dense the sun cannot be seen in the middle of the day. On Tuesday, AOTs measured around 1.4. Five, very dense in the thickest of the dust mass near the islands of Hispaniola and Jamaica, restricting visibility to less than a mile in parts of the Caribbean and making for very unhealthy air quality as, as measured by the World Air Quality Index Project. So just something you got to know and that I'm excited about the future possibilities related to, as I am about most things, I suppose. New York Post, nypost.com. There's this crazy viral video going around today. You got to see this. I wouldn't feel happy doing today's show without showing you guys at least this quick clip. New York Post reports viral video shows calm man with knife sticking out of his head in Harlem. CJ, could you get that video up full screen? This is just 35 seconds here. Yes, graphic content. Yo, please, yo, please, yo, please, yo. Stop stabbing his head, yo. It's crazy. Yo, please, yo, please, yo. read the article so this, this is like i just want to give you guys the background of this and for those of you who are just listening to the audio what we just saw was a clip of uh looks like a, a hispanic gentleman young middle-aged ponytail beard walking on the street in new york city walking up to an ambulance with a medium-sized kitchen knife i mean relatively large it's not huge it's like and they called it a cleaver in the one of the stories there's all sorts of sort of silly exaggeration around this um and you know he's looking confused and and relatively calm right going to looking for for medical help and the, one of the stories said it was clear so th there was a misreporting of this that apparently he got into a domestic dispute that he was beating up his his girlfriend and she stabbed him and then got it stuck in his head and that's that's kind of like the that's the nice caricature, self-righteous story of the internet. Ah, a guy with a knife stuck in his head must have been because he was beating on a woman. No. The reality that they said, at least in the story, was that it was uh, his wife or his girlfriend and, and him fighting off an assailant, someone attacking them with a knife. Who They first cut the woman, and then when he went in, they got the knife stuck in his head. Now... Yeah, you look. Yeah, Jim's Jim's shivering. I, same thing. I got that. Ugh, ugh, uh, yeah, it looks really painful, right? Well, apparently uh, he was on drugs, and you know, f hey, by the way, that fights happen. Jim, do you think fights happen more or less when drugs are involved? Probably more. Probably more. I'm gonna guess. Um, and there there are plenty of drugs out there that would put you in such a detached state that uh, you know that would explain this guy's behavior. The critical medical thing about this, and this is what's funny, because this this video, dude with a knife stuck in his head with blood dripping down. And if you look at it, the, there's a bit of an optical illusion here because of the guy's hair. 
He's got a ponytail. He's got a lot of hair. And when you have a full head of hair and you have a ponytail, it creates like, you know, well, let's look at Jim's hair. Jim, if you, it, the guy's got about as much hair as you. If you, if you go to the middle of your head, no, no, right here, top middle of your head and push down, how much do your fingers go down before they actually touch your skin? Like half an inch, right? There's like half an inch yeah. of hair there. And so you look at that knife, and if you if you assume that it's all in, and in his hair, it looks like it's even more, like it's buffed up, like it could be going yeah. through an inch of hair, not an inch of head, right? So here's the thing: the the reason he was okay, and he was he was relatively okay afterwards. Like I mean, said, he was released. I think uh, the the NYPD, however, said the victim and a 34 year old woman were on the same side of a dispute against another man. Uh, they didn't say if it was a wife or girlfriend or whatever, just that. And, you know, they get him in the ambulance and you see that picture there where he's stabilized. He's got, he, they, they put him on oxygen, you know, and it doesn't seem like there's, I don't know, there's a good reason for that. Uh, the man allegedly slashed the unidentified woman across the cheek before lodging the knife in Perez's head and fleeing. Uh, you know, so they, they, they were also, they were checked out. They both appear to be on drugs. No arrests or charges uh, immediately announced with this. And the knife did not penetrate the skull. That's the weird thing about this, right? So here's, this is a bit of an optical illusion, right? Because you look at that and you go, wow, that, that blade has got to be a good inch and a half, two inches into his into his skull. But because you've got an inch of hair there, it's a, it's not as big a knife as it looks like at first. It might be tapered short. And how thick is your, the actual bone in your skull? Like less than a quarter of an inch, right? I mean, I mean, maybe more in parts, but like the oh, thin the part at the top amazing. where the knife is. So that's what's crazy. But there, there really wasn't that much injury. It was just a freak strike with this blade that got lodged in a piece of his skull, not the brain. I know it's still it's still freaky, right? And you got like so here's here's Adam's viral video breakdown. It's not as crazy as it seems, but it's it's crazy in a different way. In that it, it just you know a blade that big wedged in less than a quarter of an inch of bone, sticking straight up. I mean, the guy must like it must have just happened, and the guy stood up and goes, "Oh my God, it's stuck! Oh my God, okay, don't touch it. I'm gonna walk to the ambulance." And, you know, like it would have like fallen out if he had, if he had, if he had like, if he had gone down the steps I too fast, like it would have fallen out. out. What's that? I feel like my knee jerk reaction would have been to pull it out and then hold my head and go to the hospital. I don't feel like I could just walk around with a knife in my. Head. Well, he was on drugs. Well, like, like significant dr and I, by drugs, I don't mean like weed, caffeine, right. nicotine. Like he was either severely drunk or on heroin. I mean, something that's a pain suppressant, perhaps Molly. So it's just it, it's just this weird physical freak occurrence that the blade got wedged in just into the skull, just like that. And he managed to walk around with it stuck to his head. OK. Enough of beating that horse. From the sun, predator pose, swimmer catches an eight-foot shark with his bare hands and pulls its mouth open to pose for pics. CJ, let's let's play this video. 42 seconds, please. <coughs> I have my theories about this one too. We have Yeah, I can do that. Oh yeah, no problem. <laughs> no, this so this guy is either like the world's greatest badass. I mean, I'm sorry, bad arse. Um, uh, or or this is some kind of hoax. Like I, I'm really not sure about this one. Uh, Why not? I, I, I'm, I'm like again. Like I'm, I'm looking for like the, the thing with the knife. 
You see why I'm putting these two stories together? Like there was an explanation. Was was the knife actually like wedged in his brain or in his? Was it wedged in his head? No, it was just the tip of it barely stuck in the outer layer, right? So you know, looking at this one. Now, uh, by the way, my let's see if I can unfreeze my my streamyard here. Um, all right, good. All right, that was easy. So. With this one, I'm like, wait, wait, where's so I'm, th think about the physical reality of this is an eight foot shark, big mouth. Like you'd have to be like, I'm thinking if I was in the water, like, OK, I get it. If I had to, like if I had to do this, I could do this. Right. I'm physically capable it, as a physical feat. You go, what he's doing. You know, OK, like I'm fit. Yeah, OK, dude looks fit. You know, I'm, I'm coordinated, fast, generally athletic. But how do you catch for how do you catch the thing in the first place? It looks like what he caught it by the tail. And I'm thinking physically, like you're in the water. Could could you grab a shark? Like if, yeah, it's tail kind of thing. Like that. you got a good point to grab onto there. Yeah. And likely, if the shark is that shallow, it's probably not feeling well. It's probably ill. So that's whatever. okay. So that's the it's next true. thing I was thinking. Right, is that this is a stick shark. It's he's coming into Not shallow really water to die. But if it was a healthy shark, like and you don't I mean, do you see the shark swimming slow? Like maybe that maybe this is the big reveal on this one is that the shark was very sick and swimming slow, and he saw before he caught it that it was doing that. But even then, how dumb is this? Like, how do you know that if you like even if it's a sick shark and you go up and you grab it by the tail? It's not going to flip around and just literally take a chunk out of your, not arse, but your butt cheeks or your glutes. Like, it's a big, like, and it's not, like, that shark, an eight-foot shark is not going to attack a six-foot human unless they're provoked. I mean, it's, it's the, the sharks that attack people have to be way bigger to, to real, uh, I know, that's a, Adam, what are, all right, generally speaking, they're, they're not going after people. But how do you know? You grab him by the tail, he's not going to just flip around and start thrashing and biting. And even a sick shark, aren't they going to be able to, like, if there's a certain physical reality here. A fish is mostly muscle tissue, right? Like, it's bone, muscle, gut, same as most organisms. Most of the, and, and more so with fish. Most of their mass is muscle. That's a big shark. An eight-foot shark? Just the sideways motion force that it can generate with its tail makes me go, no, there's no way a human can hold on to this or know that he did or know that he could because the shark is that sick. I mean, unless the shark is like, but even then, it it's float. Have just been floating there and he pulled it back. No, no, you see it moving in the video and then it, and then it swims away, right? The video does not show what happened to it. But so here's here's the thing, is that uh, I'm 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 guessing this is e this is either an extremely sick shark, or or it's a setup. I mean, how cool would it be? I think it's more likely to make a robot shark. There's a cool little hoax. Like I wouldn't do it. There's there's a dishonesty to it. There's a what there's a lot of like, what what if you convince a kid to grab a shark and the kid who tries it dies? Like there's a lot of reasons. I'm not. I'm, I'm not supporting this if that I'm not supporting this at all. Like this is dumb. Even if it's I mean, unless the shark is like floating on the surface and dying, and in, in which case you 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 pull it in the, you don't just let it go. Like what happened afterwards, who knows? But that makes the, the sort of lack of details with the story yeah. makes it makes it kind of fishy for me. Yeah. You know, was this was this a really sick shark? Was it a hoax? Anyway, you said we have we have do we have a winner? We have a winner. We have a winner for we today's winner. trivia contest. All right. It is very Dan exciting. USA no one, which I'm is obviously number one. Dan USA number one. Mario Savio. Is that pronounced? That's it. Yep. Mario Savio. And the location? I mean, I guess I assume if you got that, the location. Uh, oh, he didn't put the location. We were just putting the name. Well, I guess he's already at like that higher level yeah. of having gotten it, right? Right. All right, so let's play the rest of the clip for everybody's benefit. Then we're going to get through uh, just a few more headlines today. Yeah, see, uh, so Jim's got to pull it up. 
from uh well hey let's see let's see yeah yeah actually why don't you why don't you send this clip to cj we'll get it incorporated in the show properly and we're gonna play the last minute cj uh jim is gonna send you a two minute clip and since this went so well and this this is fun we're gonna we're just we're gonna plan ahead and actually do it properly next time and cj will be able to play the uh the clue clips as well so CJ, you've got that link in a few minutes. We're going to play the whole thing. Congratulations to Dan for winning a membership in the Producers Club today. We go now to the conservativetreehouse.com. Fake hate. FBI and NASCAR admit Bubba Wallace complained noose was simply a garage door pull-down rope. It took a lot longer than it should have, and it created buckets more intentional controversy than it should have but the fbi and nascar have finally admitted the noose claimed by bubba wallace was nothing more than a simple garage door rope tied in a loop and had been there since october 2019 exactly as we outlined nascar statement the fbi has completed its investigation at talladega super speedway and determined that bubba wallace was not the target of a hate crime the fbi report concludes and photographic evidence confirms that the garage door pull rope fashioned like a noose had been positioned there since as early as last fall. This was obviously well before the Team 43's arrival and garage assignment. We appreciate the FBI's quick and thorough investigation and are thankful to learn that this was not an intentional racist act against Bubba. We remain steadfast in our commitment to providing a welcoming and inclusive environment for all who love racing. Uh, now, this is against the backdrop of the George Floyd protests and the recent resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement leading NASCAR to ban the Confederate flag at its events. A lot of controversy around that. Now, this story, FBI statement, in, in parentheses, insufferably, the FBI keeps calling it a noose. It wasn't. The FBI wasn't wasted 15 FBI special agents on this investigation. Good grief. So, like, again, uh, I was I was wondering about this, like a pull-down rope. Someone made a pull-down rope and made it look like a noose to be cool or to have a handle on it or... No, it, was, it wasn't even a noose. It was just, it was a hanging loop of something. So, joint statement from U.S. Attorney J.E. Town and FBI Special Agent in Charge Johnny Sharp Jr. regarding the noose found in NASCAR's Bubba Wallace's garage at Talladega Super Speedway. On Monday, 15 FBI special agents. Yeah, your tax dollars at work, ladies and gentlemen. Conducted numerous interviews regarding the situation at Talladega Super Speedway. After a thorough review of the facts, the evidence surrounding this event, we have concluded that no federal crime was committed. The FBI learned that garage number four, where the noose was found. Again, the, yeah, they keep calling it a noose was assigned to Bubba Wallace last week. The investigation also revealed evidence, including authentic video confirmed by NASCAR that the noose found in garage number four was in that garage as early as 2019. They want to keep calling it a noose. Now, just to be clear, a noose, as I understand, just definition of the word is a specific knot of a slip knot tied to hang someone with, traditionally used in lynchings or government hangings, right? And, you know, just calling a, a loop of, of of rope a noose is is really dishonest here i i, I think they're doing this because if for attention justification keep it well where's the news whatever there's somebody it's not a noose because otherwise if it was so they, you know they just want to hang it out there to justify you know all of this instead of being like oh it was a whatever uh loop of, of rope just hanging the decision not to pursue federal charges and is proper after reviewing all available facts and applicable federal laws. We offer our thanks to NASCAR, Mr. Wallace, and everyone who cooperated with this investigation. Not surprisingly, there has been no statement from NASCAR driver Bubba Wallace. So the full backstory on this, the manual garage door rope on stall number four was tied into a hand loop by the team of Ryan Blaney sometime after the October 19th Talladega qualifier and before the start of the main race, there are numerous ropes on several garage bay doors that are tied to make similar loops at the bottom. It just makes it easier to pull the door down. This entire controversy was over absolutely nothing. 
Apparently, NASCAR wants their heavily promoted story to quietly disappear now. Oh, well, damage done. Move along. And this is why it's oh, sad to see that uh, NASCAR's one black driver had, had an opportunity to, uh, you know, to really change things. <laughs> To, to really make something else of this. Uh, and yet ended up going the way of Jesse Smollett on this one. So who's responsible for this? Bubba himself, you know, is it, and I, you know, do, do you want to, surely he knew that he wasn't going to get away with this. And it would have been, you know, like, how dumb and desperate for attention do you have to be to be seen as the persecuted victim? Huge consequence here of, of the victim mentality, of victim culture. Of, uh, we take care of victims, uh, you know, more more than anybody else. But this thing, like, it would have been so easy for him to to close the garage door. I don't, I, can, I don't know, maybe. Security can't go somewhere. There aren't security cameras. First of all, hang up the news. I, I'm giving you guys for any black Americans who want to know how to do a hate crime hoax properly. I assume you're not as dumb as Smollett or Wallace. I don't have to tell you do it without people who are going to betray you involved like Jesse Smollett. Uh, do it where there aren't security cameras like with the assault against him that was apparently recorded as well. You know, don't hang, don't, don't just, oh, that, that loop of rope, that's got to be a noose. Fake it better than that. I suppose there's one other important point in this whole story. Because the, uh, oh, you got another story there, CJ. Bubba Wallace relieved. He did address it. So this, so he did address it. So what? So let, let's. All right, let's give him the benefit of the doubt here. Let's let's hear in his words. Thank you, CJ. The other point I was going to make stands here, in that, in that. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. NASCAR describing it uh, as a as a garage door pull that was fashioned like a noose. The FBI saying you were not. Uh, the target of, of a hate crime and that it had been there at least since last October. When you found that out on Tuesday, Bubba, what was your initial reaction? Um, you know, I was I was relieved, just like um, just like many others to know that it wasn't targeted towards me. Um, but um, it's it's still frustrating to know that, you know, people are always going to test you and always just going to try to debunk you. And that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around now from, uh, from, you know, saying I'm a fake and, and all this stuff and that I reported it when it was uh, news that was brought to me. It was information that was brought to me that was already reported. And so I was just kind of following suit. But all in all, it's another day. I mean, you, you, you never saw the room for yourself. As Sam no. pointed out, you didn't report it. Uh, yourself either is is there anything that you would have done different um no because when i when i did find out i was very adamant on searching all the garages and making sure uh that this wasn't a garage pool and and uh ended up being one um but the uh the photo evidence that i've seen um and that i have in my possession of what was in our garage is exactly a garage pool it is uh that is a noose. So it's, uh, you know, it's, I don't know when we'll get to the point to release that, that image, but it's, uh, anybody sees it, then it's, it's, it's alerting and it, and it makes you, it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up for sure. But, uh, all in all, like NASCAR says, you know, it's, it's a thing that I wouldn't change a thing. I would, I would alert the NASCAR officials, and let them kind of take care of it. If I had seen it in person, let let them know about it and let them take care of it. Bubba, to, to be clear here, it sounds like you don't think that this passes the smell test. It sounds like you're still fairly convinced that, that what was in that garage stall wasn't a rope pull, 
but it was a noose and it was designed to to intimidate or make a statement. Is that what you still believe? It was it was a it was a rope pull for for the garage door. It was attached. The, the image you see of where it was cut, that's exactly what it was, but it was definitely in the shape of a noose. It wasn't a functioning noose. I talked to the FBI the, the two conversations I had with the FBI, which I never thought I'd talk to the FBI in my lifetime. So, hey, there's always something new. Um, they uh, they said the first one was right after the race and said they're going to do everything in their power to figure it out. And they'll be in contact. And then the second conversation was the final one to where they gave me the lowdown of all the investigation and research they, they, had, they have completed and found out that um, that it was a garage pool. But it in fact was a noose. It was not a functioning noose, but it, it it was a noose. And whoever had the time to create that and and tie it up like that, just they were they were skeptical about it. And um, you know, and the FBI says that types those types of things. And I and I told them I had questioned my my team members. Are we sure that this isn't um, something that we're kind of taking out of context? And they backed my team up and reiterated that. If if you were to see this uh, at this time, you would stand with your team right now. Of why they were so alerted, so it's uh, it is what it is. So I know there's I know how the information was brought to me and how it was prosecuted and and how I was just kind of on the sidelines. But let's go back. Yeah. Let's go back to Talladega. All right. So CJ, thank you for that. Now, can I, I'm still a little bit skeptical here. So. From from his story here, I I don't think he's he's um I don't think he's blameless in this at all. I I think he now if he's not the one who saw it and reported it and blew it up, then you know he not, he's not guilty of that. He's not guilty of uh, initiating this, so to speak. But I think Bubba here, and and I, I'm not saying like yeah, again, you know I'm not trying to give a decisive opinion here, but I think he's guilty of going along with this when he could have put a put a stop to it from the beginning i mean he could have walked up and like okay that's a garage pull that's not a noose like if someone was going to do that they would you know, oh there's a little symbol here like and you know it's been around for a while. like but where's where's the actual picture but like obviously it's not a functioning noose because it's not big enough rope or at least you know from what i would understand a garage door pull just enough to grab a hand not enough to like choke someone or support you know body weight necessarily obviously it's not a functioning noose um so cj has got this picture i saw that one from the article pulled up there but i i can you make out like the the new the, the rope itself is there a picture of like the actual rope loop um like as i just did a quick uh, google search bubba wallace noose picture and there's there's nothing of the the rope itself Oh, wait, here we go. All right, so I found it on CNN. So CNN has this, you know, it's, it's a pretty grainy picture. You see that it's a loop, and it's a part that's tied up, so like it looks like a news. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say because it was a functioning door pull, it wasn't, like, you don't put a slip knot on something you're pulling a door with like that, right? So someone just tied it up like that, and that was how they – knew how to tie a knot and we're like okay well then i'm not trying to like I, i'm really trying to understand this not, okay so cj's got another picture here okay but that's a different one is that the same garage cj uh and that's that's definitely not a uh that's definitely not a noose there i mean it's a, a loop with with a knot i mean you can see like, every loop with a knot is now we're going to call it a noose even if it's a non-functioning noose Well, check out my hand. It's a non-functioning battering ram. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that. And see, I think what Bubba is guilty of here, and if I'm missing some other element of the story, we got two. We're gonna go a little long. I got two more stories that I just I do have to get to today for for top headlines or or current headlines. Um, but uh, it it. it it sounds like he's guilty of going along with this at least because he said his it was brought to his attention it was his crew that was in the garage well he could have walked over there himself 
and been like, yeah, this is one of the normal door pulls. This has been here. This is, you know, look into it and go, okay, it's not. They let this blow up. The other point I was getting at, the last one I'll make regarding the story is that America is so desperate for these kinds of, you know, narrative reaffirming stories that they'll run with something sensational before it's confirmed or corrected or, you know, it, and then, you know, what ends up happening? Again, people should be discredited who aren't. And we get away with this because we don't hold people to a higher standard of intellectual integrity. And yeah, Trump personally deserves some of the blame for that. All right. Have to, have to share. So we're going to do two more stories real quick. And then we're going to play the Mario Savio clip to wrap this up. This uh, story came to us on our producer club <coughs> chat on Telegram from MSN.com. From the Telegraph, residents surrender Thai City to monkey gangs headquartered in an abandoned cinema. Whoa. Yeah. Residents of the ancient Thai city of Laburi are living in fear of marauding gangs of monkeys as thousands of primates brawl with each other, attack shops, and take over the streets in search of food during the coronavirus lockdown. Laburi province and the antics of its macaques have long lured hordes of foreign tourists who pose with them for selfies in exchange for free bananas. But as tourism dried up because of the global pandemic, so too did the monkeys' food supplies, prompting a violent turn in their behavior. Ah, unintended consequences. Local efforts to make to offer the monkey mobs some nutrition may have backfired, as some say a sugary diet of fizzy drinks, cereal, and sweets has fueled the animals' sex lives, making their population grow even more. As Pramo Kitampai, who manages the city's Prong Samyad Temple Shrine, sold AFP, the more they eat, the more energy they have, so they breed more. Oh, funny how that works. Monkeys patrol the walls of the temple in the center of the 800-year-old city to protect their turf. In March, they staged a brazen raid on another group of monkeys living around the Fra Khan Shrine on the prowl for temple offerings. Their invasion, captured in a video that went viral on social media, resulted in a vicious street fight that stopped traffic for 10 minutes as the rival gangs screeched, charged at each other, and engaged in paw-to-paw -paw combat. As uh, Supakarn Kai Chot, a government veterinarian, told Reuters, Reuters, they're so used to having tourists feed them and the city provides no space for them to fend for themselves. With the tourists gone, they've been more aggressive, fighting humans for food to survive. They're invading buildings and forcing locals to flee their homes. The human population has had to continue with uneasy existence as part of cities, parts of the city cede complete control to the monkeys. Man, these videos are incredible. Thank you for pulling that up, CJ. An abandoned cinema has reportedly become the primate's headquarters with the projection room turned into a cemetery where the monkeys lay their dead to rest. A nearby shop owner said he displayed stuffed tiger and crocodile toys to try to scare off the creatures and prevent them from snatching spray paint hands. As, as one resident said, we live in a cage, but the monkeys live outside. Their excrement is everywhere. The smell is unbearable, and especially when it rains. For years, city residents have had a love-hate relationship with their monkey neighbors who attract tourist dollars but regularly create mayhem, breaking windows, stealing groceries, and damaging cars. So I'm wondering, like, is what's happening to uh, property values in the city if people are leaving? Obviously, a very, very cheap place to buy a home or an apartment right now if you don't mind living in Monkey City. Interesting option for homesteading. Maybe you could build yourself a monkey-proof homestead. In the middle of it, maybe you could, maybe, I mean, you could have, maybe you could have an awesome house with a monkey cage all around it as these, these, these hordes are coming in and just put, like, this is crazy. This, and you think about the, like, why I, I'm excited about the story. It's cool. It's not as like a freak phenomena, but what it, it makes me think of in terms of could, 
humans make an abandon. How many times in human history have we abandoned cities? So like, yeah, you know how we put all this effort into building this city? Yeah, not even worth saving anymore. We're just gonna walk away from it. Like what you know, and I, Chaco Canyon in in our neighboring state of New Mexico, where I've I've done some filming, like Native American city, just abandoned. D- different things over different periods of time have caused this before. You think in the modern era, what was the last time humanity? I can't even think of it. What was it like? Is there a recent time that I'm sure they're a little, you know, in war and conflict. You know, there there have been times, but. Like, what was the last time humanity was like, yeah, we're just going to walk away from this project now. We don't want to live here anymore. Too many monkeys. Okay, Chernobyl. There you go. Yeah. That's yeah. what really Chernobyl. Monkeys, though. Yeah. Monkeys. And is it mad? And it's funny. This is also a man made, like, every project I've started and failed at, I feel so much better thinking about Chernobyl, you know, and, and, and thinking about, um, this city, uh, what, what is the name of the city? La Burri. You know, I think about La Burri here, and it's like, well, yeah, they screwed up. Like, we try, we put all this ever, we created this, and then we screwed up the animal control part, and now we're kind of, now, so are they going to abandon the city? Like, chunks of it being seeded, they just give, ah, where is this, this whole neighborhood? This is monkey territory now. <laughs> Monkeys beat the humans. In a city made by people, not made by monkeys. So for years, city residents have had a love-hate relationship with their monkey neighbors who attract tourist dollars, but regularly create mayhem, breaking windows, stealing groceries, and damaging cars. But the worsening fights, along with reports of locals barricading themselves in their homes and no-go zones for humans, have prompted the authorities to intervene, restarting a sterilization program after a three-year pause. Wildlife department officers have placed big cages around the city, filling them with fruit to lure the animals inside and then take them to a clinic where they are anesthetized, sterilized, and left with a tattoo to mark their neutering. They aim to treat hundreds out of the 6,000 strong macaque population within the next few weeks. Well. To the good people of Lapuri, good luck reclaiming your city. The big question that comes out of the story is, which is more effective? The Occupy movement or a horde of monkeys? So far, it looks like the monkeys are winning. Our last story for the day, Amazon censors killing free speech documentary about censorship. Amazon has removed the first part of Killing Free Speech, a documentary about the threats of freedom of expression posed by Antifa and its allies in the media and Democrat parties. The second part of the documentary focused on the power of big tech will shortly be released. This is the second time that the documentary's creator, independent Danish-American conservative filmmaker Michael Hansen, has been censored by Amazon. As Breitbart News reported last year, Hansen's Previous documentary about mass migration in Islam in Europe was also censored by the big tech platform. From an email by Amazon to Hansen, hello, thank you for your email regarding Killing Free Speech Part 1 upon review. Your title is not eligible for publishing at this time. No further action by you is required. And I, hey, you know, while I'm punching you in the face, let me remind you, no further action by you is required. Hey, imagine hearing that from a mugger on the street. Give me your wallet. Okay, cool. I take your wallet. By the way, thank you for participating in this mugging. No further action is required by you. Have a nice day. Please do not resubmit the same title for publishing. In the meantime, we will provide any publication status updates in your provider portal. Thank you for using Prime Video Direct. Uh, they're still both available for purchase on Vimeo. Killing Free Speech Part 1 shows an official from the Council on American-Islamic Re- Relations uh, care caught on camera admitting that women don't have equal rights under Sharia law. The documentary also charts the rise of Antifa in the United States, highlighting how the American movement has been influenced by violent mili- militants in Europe. 
Part two, which features an interview with this reporter about tech censorship, has received pray, uh, praise from Border Patrol agents, and that would be Alam Bukhari, who wrote this piece. Kill, quote, killing free speech gave us a voice and an opportunity to speak the truth, and it is a powerful state testament to the men and women of the Border Patrol who risk their lives every day. According to Terrence Shig, National Border Patrol Council Local 1613 President. Hansen's previous documentary about Islam in Europe has faced censorship in Canada when conservatives there attempted to hold a private viewing at a public library. Amazon, whose founder and CEO is far left Washington Post owner Jeff Bezos, has stepped up censorship in recent years. The platform removed prime video links to hoaxed Mike Cernovich's documentary about media manipulation and also recently banned a book about the coronavirus from skeptical science writer Alex Berenson only reversing the latter decision following media pressure. Now, why is this being censored? Well, let's say you live in a world of censorship where statists of left, right, and center stripes are all trying to censor anybody who disagrees with them. Not, not that uh, you, not people from all of those demographics are trying to censor people in, in different competing ideologies to theirs. And it seems like this documentary isn't really taking an honest look at your censorship as a whole. It's looking at particular censorship conducted by the you know left wing of the modern socialist paradigm as opposed to the right wing of the modern socialist paradigm love you know as personified by the Republican Party and modern conservatives. So this is this is not like a uh, you know, a, a real shift in, in censorship or, or freedom of speech or intellectual property or anything like that, because they're using, you know, partisan excuses here. And I just think it's a cool story to report on to say, yeah, look at the snake of political fallacies of, of, of left-right partisanship eating its own tail. All right, with that, let's wrap the show up today. Before we go for a final check-in on comments, let's see the second minute of that clip from our contest, please, if you would, CJ. This is Mario Savio with the famous speech about putting your body on the wheels and the levers from Berkeley at the student protests there. You know, I don't even know exactly what year this was, but this was after the anti-Vietnam student protests had grown into uh, a whole host of other student reform protests. And one of the things they were protesting, as you hear in this speech here, is the corruption of the leadership of uh, Berkeley University. The reason this became a thing is that there was a clear, it wasn't just students are more inclined to protest wars and universities promoted. It was like, oh, you're getting shot, Kent State, hello. Four protesters shot by National Guard troops for protesting. So it was the interaction with the universities and the Vietnam War policy specifically that led the student movement to pay attention to, well, how come all of these things are happening at the university, we came here to learn, and this institution that we're supposed to be learning from is supporting the war effort that we disagree. Like, wait, how is that part of the deal? So, CJ, roll tape and go ahead, play the whole thing from the beginning. It's just a minute and 47 seconds here. I didn't know when, when this video version that we found it, there's a clip from someone else, but go ahead, CJ. So, here we are. Four students are getting the axe. Six organizations are getting the axe for standing up this semester and for fighting for these things. They're getting the axe not for what they did, but for what we have done. They spoke for us, they were part of us, they have been singled out, and they're going to be chopped off. We were told the following. If President Kerr actually tried to get something more liberal out of the regions in his telephone conversations, why didn't he make some public statement to that effect? And the answer we received from a well-meaning liberal was the following. He said, would you ever imagine the manager of a firm making a statement publicly in opposition to his board of directors? 
That's the answer. I ask you to consider if this is affirmed and if the Board of Regents are the Board of Directors and if President Kerr, in fact, is the manager. And I tell you something, the faculty are a bunch of employees and we're the raw materials. But we're a bunch of raw materials that don't mean to be, have any process upon us, don't mean to be made into any product, don't mean, don't mean to end up being bought by some clients of the university, be they the government, be they industry, be they organized labor, be they anyone, or human beings. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Mm-hmm. You know, I know we're a little over time right now, but I just had an epiphany. I think you're going to find this a little fun, worth exploring. CJ, would you please pull up the Howard Beale from Network, the movie speech? And I believe that was 1976, easily available on YouTube. You're going to see why. There's a huge rhetorical, there are two huge rhetorical parallels. And now I'm seeing, I believe that this was the inspiration for the famous fictional speech by Howard Beale in the movie Network. While he's doing that, Jim, any other comments you want to get to today? Uh, well, let's see. Um, earlier, Kevin Freed had asked if there's any way for him to get some free books so he can give them away to people. He's in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, yeah, a uh, quick update on, on books, I guess, is just a general status thing. Uh, we're down to like a thousand right now. Um, we've already, you know, we've given out a lot. And I don't have the money right now to order another printing and I wouldn't want to do it for less than uh, $4,000 to get 10,000 copies. And, you know, I've, I've, we've had a lot of these requests. I mean, not a lot. I mean, they come, you know, and it's very, very consistent, which, which gives me yeah. confidence in the, you know, the continued value of the book for people. Uh, and everybody who reads it, yeah, yeah, I, I share this with everybody else, else right? right? So, so and yeah, there's yeah, the free at, at freedomline.com slash freedom. Thank you, CJ. So, you know, if if if, if I had four that someone said, Adam, here's four thousand dollars, order ten thousand books, make it happen, I would do it, and we get them. And uh, the, the way it worked, well, geez, uh, I almost I almost got us in trouble again. Um, I I don't know because they got they came from China. Although our our from what I know at this point, everything is still, I mean, we might just have to pay a little bit more in, in, in tariffs. And wait a little longer. In fact, there might be a little bit, well, I don't think so. If anything, um, because the shipping has, well, either way, it's two weeks. Because that's how long it takes to move a cargo ship from, from China to, to LA, basically. Right. And, and that's how we did it last time. We had, uh, they were delivered on, it was 10,000 books was two pallets, like a really high, two and a half really high stack pallets and uh, they went to a customs warehouse in LA and we picked them up with a pickup truck and a trailer and brought them back here to the shipping container at the garden. And then we were, you know, it, you know, and people want to, uh, is, is someone want to sponsor that? If someone wants to put together a crowd, like eventually uh, I'm going to have to do it myself, you know, one way or another, is this the easiest way for me to get the 4,000, you know, yeah, I, I think we should do uh, you know another special print run, just another ten thousand copies of Freedom, to to be able to give them away. So if if, if someone want if uh, if someone wants to to just sponsor that independently or in chunks, you know, if you want to find, uh, I mean, every time I do this math, I think, well, you could have sex with five hundred chicks for a hundred dollars each. Or you could have sex with 50 really fat chicks for $1,000 each. I, I don't even remember what movie that's from, but that line is just stuck in my head. Math and sex, it's just, yeah, I can't perfectly combine there. Yeah, so we need $4,000. You know, we could have, and and, and really, it would probably more like, you know, well, probably another 1000 for logistical overhead just of renting truck and trailer and driving there and back. And, you know, customs, like they, they charge us a 
for the privilege of being inspected, uh, you know, we, we, we have to pay for that. And that was a few hundred dollars. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was, it was BS government, but it was, it wasn't unreasonable, so to speak. Um, and then if we had some money to send them out too, we get a lot of requests from people who just want free books and we could say, you know, send them out in single signed books. Uh, postage is more expensive when you're talking about sending out signed books than the books themselves. All right, with that, CJ, that was it? All right, CJ, do you have, do we have it? Do you want me to, do, or do, you, do you need uh, Jim to find it here or send you the link? There we go, there it is. All right, so go ahead and play. We might need to skip ahead a little bit. What is what is this version you've got? Okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead and roll tape, CJ. Howard. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street, and there's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do, and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. And we sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel belt and radios and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to write. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. I want you to get up right now. Get up, Stay with go to your windows, open them, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Things have got to change. How many stations first. does this You've go out? You've got to get mad. You've got to say, I know it goes to Louisville and Atlanta. I'm not going to take this anymore. Then we'll figure out what to do about the depression and the inflation and the oil crisis. But first, get up out of your chairs, open the window, stick your head out and yell, and say, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. Who are you talking talking to her. Are they yelling in Atlanta, Herb? Are they yelling in Atlanta, Ted? But first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. They're yelling in Baton Rouge. God damn it. Get up, get up, get up out of your Son of a bitch! We struck the mother low. Stick your head out of the window, open it, and stick your head out and keep yelling and yell, I'm as mad as hell. I'm not going to take this anymore. Just get up from your chairs right now. Go to Where the window. Where are you going? I want to see if anybody's yelling. Window, open it and stick your head out and yell and keep yelling. I'm mad as hell. How am I not taking this anymore? I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to take it anymore.
scene from the movie network i recommend everybody watch that it's fun it's easy to find on torn you can download it for free uh it's a fun movie and a really powerful scene and statement there and in a way the bigger narrative perhaps a little more disappointing to solutionaries like yourselves but uh, a very powerful message and a lot of stuff uh, good stuff to learn and to ponder from that movie network 1976 look it up i just wanted you to highlight that that part of the speech where you know he says no, I'm a human being. Wait. I'm not allowed to quote a YouTube video that we just played from YouTube onto my YouTube live, or I'm going to get in trouble from, for cursing. Yeah. And it's okay if we do it once if it's in the video, but if I say now, so anyway, I'm a human, can I say, God damn it? I can say, God damn it. I'm a human being, God damn it. My life has been. Mm, all right. Well, now there's three GDs in the in the show. It, all right. Um, yeah. See, one of them might have been okay. Now they're gonna now they're gonna ping me for this. I can't wait till we <clears> get to <throat> Patreon. Portion. We'll get there. We'll get there. One less thing. Yeah. It'll, it's you're, it's gonna be like as fun as this is. It's like you know, a fish is not aware of the water in which it swims. In the same way that animals, humans are not aware of the air in which we live until we. You know, think about it and say, oh, yeah, there's, there's, it's not nothing. It's going to be the same thing, lifting censorship from the internet and even just from this show. Just, oh, no, oh, that's what Adam sounds like. And I, see, I didn't get to this point earlier, but talking about the censorship, one of the things I'm looking forward to this is just all the ways that, you know, it's not just cursing and, and playing videos and, you know, music, other IP stuff. It's, what that I, I don't even know how much better the show is going to be without that, you know, psychological burden of constant worrying about thing, just the, the cognitive load. Do I have you know, I have to think about this and this and is this appropriate while I'm trying to compose my thoughts to make the most impact that I can for everybody in the audience? So then he says, you know, you 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 got to get mad as hell and and, and go outside and yell. I, I really like Mario's version better. Put your body on the gears and the levers of the machine and tell the people who run it that unless you're free, the machine will not be allowed to operate at all. Well, in reality, with that metaphor, I think it's easier to just say, I'm not going to be a part of your machine anymore. I'm going to choose happiness. So with that, mwah, peace and love, y'all. Choose happiness and be excellent.